good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting uh, in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. As usual at this point, I would, like, I would ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones and other wireless devices uh, as they can often interfere with the sound system. Of course, in saying that, um, I, I need to point out to our panelists this morning that some <coughs> members and officials are using tablet devices and this is instead of their hard copies uh, of their papers. I'm pleased to say that I've got no apologies uh, th this morning and uh, we give a very well, re warm welcome back to Nanette Millen. Um, it's good to see you back, Nanette. Um, we are moving now to our first item, which of course is to take evidence uh, at stage one on the Food Scotland Bill. Um, we have with us this morning Sue Davis, uh, Chief Policy Advisor, which Dr James Wildgoose, Chair of Food Advisory Committee, Scottish Food Advisory Committee. Uh, Alistair Donaldson, for, former member of Meat and Livestock Commission, member of Scudamore Review Panel. Can I welcome all of you here this morning with us for our um, uh, deliberations? And given the pressure of time, and the, 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 we, we will go straight to questions, if that's OK. Um, our first question is from Gil Patterson. Thank you, Gil. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> I'm just wondering if uh, Food Scotland, uh, Food Standards Scotland, is merely uh, taking over the functions uh, and administration from the FSA, or is there likely to be any benefits, financial or financially, or uh, to the, the well-being and health of the, the Scottish people? Do I press? Yes, thanks very much. Perhaps I could just explain um, uh, the role of the Scottish Food Advisory Committee that I chair. Um, th that committee is, is part of the Food Standards Agency, which is a UK-wide body, um, and it, essentially it, um, it, it provides information, input, interest from Scotland in terms of the UK deliberations of the UK board. So I chair that committee and I also sit on the FSA board uh, and, and essentially we look at um, all of the papers that come forward for uh, decision um, at the UK board and offer um, a, a Scottish input into that. So it's part and parcel of, of the FSA. I might say that coming here this morning, I'm not speaking on behalf of the FSA, I'm speaking on behalf really of the Scottish Food Advisory Committee and the interest in Scotland associated with that. So there, there's no financial interest uh, in, in, in point of fact, it's simply the regime that we have under the current UK system uh, for allowing Scottish interest to be reflected in uh, the deliberations at UK level. I hope that's helpful in, in answering, yeah. Thank you. Um, we think that this is a real opportunity to create a really strong new body that will be a real consumer champion. So I th we think it should be much more than just an administrative transfer of responsibilities. Um, we campaign for the Food Standards Agency to be set up and to put consumers first, operate openly and transparently. But the Food Standards Agency in England has had some of its um, responsibilities taken away, which was one of the reasons for reviewing um, whether or not there needed to be a separate agency in Scotland. And in particular, we think there's a real opportunity to enhance the, the way that, the, uh, that Food Standards Scotland works compared with the agency, being more open and transparent in the way that it works, but also... Um, tackling issues that are specific to Scotland, in particular focusing more on issues around diet and health than has been possible as part of the Food Standards Agency, and um, obviously getting to the bottom of some of the food safety issues such as tackling E. coli 157 and other types of food poisoning, but also the real problem that we have with food fraud at the moment, and some research that Witch did recently shows that um, we, we found... Um, that many lamb takeaways weren't actually lamb, they contained other types of meat. So coming off the back of horse meat, I think there's a real need to get to grips with what's happening there. Obviously, the um, Food Standards Scotland will have to be closely linked in and, and work closely with the Food Standards Agency in order to make sure that it's influencing EU policy effectively and um, effectively getting to grips with a very globalised and complex supply chain. But we think it's a real opportunity to go further and, and make it a much stronger agency that really puts consumers first. Another question that... 
in relation to the fact that uh, Scotland is a, a, a very significant uh, food producer uh, uh, and uh, also we've got a, a big processing uh, interest uh, in it. and during the last uh, food and mouth uh, incident uh, what, there was lots of concerns from the manufacturers and the food producers or the processors and, and, and the food producers that um, since Scotland was uh, free from that particular attack um, that they felt that they would be unfairly treated and I wondered what your thoughts were with uh, the new uh, agency that was being set up would it have the powers or the prospect to perhaps take a different line uh, if something similar happened in Scotland or it could well be the opposite something happens in Scotland with some incident here that was uh, peculiar to Scotland and not affecting any other part of the United Kingdom, so that the other parts of the United Kingdom could act differently? Uh, or, or is that just a step too far with regards to what's been proposed? Dr. Mr. thanks very much. Um, th there's a certain sense in which uh, what you're saying uh, would be true, that having food standards Scotland, you know, decisions could be made, made in Scotland, would be made in Scotland. But to use the, the, the term bugs don't obey borders as such, there would need to be very, very close liaison with um, uh, the arrangements in, in the rest of the UK. Um, and that itself would, um, I hesitate to say limit, but it would influence the actions that would be taken in the policy sense um, on things like food and mouth disease. We need to take... Food Standards Scotland would need to take these arrangements very seriously and, 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 and coordinate very closely with the rest of the UK in fighting something like foot and mouth disease and indeed uh, other very uh, infectious type, uh, type diseases. So uh, we mustn't move away from the thought that that, that that collaboration is absolutely essential going forward, even having um, the separate body in Scotland. Can I just make another comment that's, that's relevant to what you're saying? Um, this body, uh, and rightly in my view, as, as the current FSA uh, has, has got consumers as the key focus. Safety, uh, standards, nutrition, the whole area, consumers is the main focus. It's not producers as such. But the key thing is that if you have safe food and it's guaranteed safe food, or as guaranteed as you can make it, that is also in the producer interest, because it, it means that you're, you're generating a system that means that the food that's produced in Scotland is recognised as being safe and of a standard, uh, etc. So, in that roundabout way, it is not the focus to have a producer interest with this, but the by maintaining a consumer interest, you also you also enhance business uh, as such. And that's where the sustainable business comes from in ensuring safe food and a food of a particular standard. Uh, just to add, I mean, I, I would certainly emphasise that bugs don't recognise boundaries, so there has to be a collaborative approach uh, on some of the major issues. But to turn this round into more of a positive in terms of food, um, I was on the Scudamore panel representing the meat sector and I think in relation to meat inspection there are real opportunities partly as a result of changes to EU regulations that are in the pipeline uh, to actually enhance uh, food inspection activities and indeed to aim, the ultimate goal should be an aim of a farm to fork assurance service and that would underpin the Scotch label, you would appreciate the Scotch label has recognition internationally and to be able to go forward saying that we have a well-placed food safety system in, in operation uh, can do nothing but enhance these opportunities. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I would agree with Jim's point about you know, bugs not stopping at the border, obviously, and I think it's going to be important to look at things on a case-by-case -case basis. It may be appropriate and possible for Scotland to take a different approach on some issues, but the way that it works will have to be seen in the context of what's happening across the UK, um, how possible it is to put controls in place, and also the wider EU context, where obviously a lot of this is going to be decided by EU legislation. 
Um, and I'd agree with the point that, you know, it, the, having a strong agency um, that puts consumers first will have wider benefits for the food industry. But I think it's really important to make sure that the agency reaches its decisions based on the evidence and that it um, shows very clearly and transparently how it reaches its decisions and that it doesn't get into any issues around um, trade issues or, or, or trade promotion directly. Perhaps maybe put in the public record and agree with uh, Jim, uh, uh, Dr. Jim Welgus that I, when I was visiting China, no, nothing to do with food, uh, but on another, I, I do business on my company that does business in China, that I was amazed that people approached me on the Scottish label, and it was actually on the basis of it being so uh, trustworthy uh, that they were interested in purchasing, not because of what they perceived the quality, it's because it was so trustworthy that the food, so I agree entirely uh, with, with your sentiments expressed. Just in a couple of sessions we have, you know, what, what, what will the bill achieve? I mean, we, we've heard a private brief this morning that in terms of um, foot and mouth, then the regulation and standards are already in place to monitor this, the, the, the enforcement lies out <laughs> with the agency itself, it's with local authorities or indeed supermarket chains as we heard yesterday which is much more rigorous you know, in, in terms of inspection. Um, you know, so how, how, how will this bill enhance any of these functions when the aim is to reassure people that nothing much is going to change. We're going to still be plugged into the research and the sharing of information uh, and, 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 and indeed the need to do that. What, what, what is the, the point of this bill? Mr. Dr. Welgus. Chairman, I, it's, a, it's a, a, a fair point, but I think there are some very clear reasons why we have this, this uh, separate arrangement or that we have a, a separate bill and a separate agency um, set up. Um, you will recall, uh, no doubt from uh, the briefing you've received, that there was machinery of government changes in the UK in 2010, which removed uh, responsibility for uh, nutrition in relation to the population and also a very large element of labelling um, from the Food Standards Agency. So you had this um, odd position where a UK body, the Food Standards Agency, had responsible for, responsibility for these issues uh, on nutrition in Scotland and Northern Ireland, but not in England and Wales. Now, that's really not a tenable position, bearing in mind that um, uh, nutrition and particularly obesity, for example, which is clearly an, a, an, a, an element within that, is a fundamental issue for Scotland going forward. Um, and I think um, there's a, a lot that this agency, this body, can do uh, in, relation to, uh, in relation to that. Um, I would say they would need to work very closely with other bodies uh, 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 with that. But I think there's a lot to be gained quite apart from the things that Alistair's mentioned about being able to take decisions ourselves, or in Scotland rather, uh, on things like the controls, etc. Um, that area is very significant uh, in my view, and I think this new body could give very uh, considerable leadership amongst the bodies that have an interest in nutrition and obesity, um, not taking over uh, their interests, but actually giving leadership in this area to an issue that will become, or has become, very, very significant in Scottish life, uh, public life, um, over this while. I think the other issue is, uh, I think the horsemeat um, uh, issue has demonstrated that labelling and standards are fundamental also in terms of uh, keeping that together with safety and that machinery of government change that occurred in the UK in 2010 made that split and it was not, in my view, a helpful split. Uh, and I think that, that came home to roost, so to speak, um, with the horse meat incident. Uh, there are some other things I could mention, uh, but they're, they're to do with um, uh, decisions that can be taken in Scotland to do with regulation, uh, to do with enforcement, uh, a whole range of different things on that. 
Um, but I think the two main things that I've mentioned on nutrition and on labelling uh, are crucial and are fundamental to this new body. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's a question we're asking, what would we do differently, as we asked yesterday? But we were, we were told earlier today in a private briefing that we've already got the powers in terms of labelling. If we, decide, if we wanted to change labelling in, in Scotland, we, we, we can do that now. Um, strictly, that, that, that's correct, but the advice actually comes through and the responsibility is with the Food Standards Agency uh, on that, so that, it's that agency that's giving advice. What would happen would be there would be a change and the new body in Scotland would then give the advice uh, on this. Now, the legislative position is, as you say, that, that those things are devolved um, and the decisions can be taken, but who is giving the advice on them? It would be the new body rather than the FSA. So is it more likely they would do something in labelling? Yes. It, well, well um, we would be able to take our own decisions on, on, on labelling uh, uh, as such, and uh, advice would come forward that would be uh, uh, an ashamedly Scottish advice uh, as such on that, rather than UK advice. It just relates to some evidence we took yesterday about the concern of manufacturers if we had different label regimes here in Scotland as against yeah, I, the I, rest of the UK market. I think it's important to realise that, that, again, this comes back to the issue um, of coordination with others. Um, I think it would, it, it's not right to think that we would end up making a whole lot of different decisions as such. Um, we'd need to coordinate and make sure the decisions that we were taking were the right ones uh, and were ones that were, that were not um, hampering industry um, uh, as such. But there will be certain things where we might want to do things slightly differently. Um, uh, I, I think that one of the key things is actually bringing and making sure these things uh, on labelling uh, and standards more generally are kept together with the food safety issues. They are not down south, whereas this new body will mean that they will be together and that the decisions and issues will be considered in the round rather than different parts of government deciding, deciding on them. A consumer-led food standards agency through Davis? I think that is the, is the key thing. It's an opportunity to really make sure that you have got a strong consumer champion and that we've got an agency that, I suppose, sets the benchmark for how other agencies should be operating. Um, we think, and it was one of the recommendations of the Scudamore report, the first Scudamore report as well, that it's really important to have food safety and nutrition and standards in, in one place. And as Jim mentioned, I think particularly since horse meat, it's become clear that food standards issues haven't been getting enough attention and need to become a greater priority. We would also see the nutrition area as one where, you know, there, there, is, there is a real problem. There's a problem around the whole UK. Scotland has um, high rates of obesity and diet-related disease, and it's obviously a very complex issue, but giving the agency, um, or Food Standards Scotland, um, more potential to do work in that area... Um, would, would be a, a bigger advantage. I suppose the other area as well, the sort of third area within the objectives that have been put out in the bill, are the other consumer interests in relation to food. And I think those are often poorly defined. They're in the remit of the, the current Food Standards Agency. But a lot of issues, whether it's about food production methods, whether it's genetic modification or you know, water added to food or um, different types of production methods... They can also raise different social and ethical issues that mean that consumers may want to have a decision about whether or not they're eating particular types of products. And so I think that kind of area is something as well that is, is important that, the, that Food Standards Scotland can look at. Mr Dolls, do you want to comment? Uh, I think uh, you can really raise an important point about uh, differences um, that may arise in terms of labelling requirements or legisl legislative requirements. Uh, in different parts of the country. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I mean, the Scudamore panel went out of its way to emphasise the importance of continuing collaboration. And the question that then become, uh, given that, uh, where are the opportunities? And uh, dwelling in my own sector, if you took the meat inspection service, which is actually an integral part of Food Standards Scotland, um, there are real opportunities to tailor it to the needs of the Scottish processing industry and to make sure it delivers an efficient, effective service. And I think within the industry there would be a view that that would be a very positive and worthwhile thing. Thank you. Uh, Rhoda Grant. 
followed by Bob. Can I just follow on um, first on, on the last question about labelling? Um, from our visits yesterday, I understood that Scotland had led the way in the changes of labelling that are being implemented and was following a decision in Scotland to change labelling that the rest of the UK had followed on. Um, is that correct or were we given the wrong information? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the detail of, of um, the issue you refer to. I, there is some leeway in, in terms of uh, decision-making uh, separately uh, in, in Scotland, uh, but I, I don't know the detail of, of that. Um, all the labelling legislation is EU-based, and so uh, the, the ground rules are really set from Brussels um, as such. Now, there is some... There is some um, um, derogations or there are some changes that, that member states can make use of and I suspect it's in that area um, that you're referring to so I don't think it's inconsistent as such um, but it's not possible to make uh, wholesale different changes in, in labelling uh, that would go against what the EU legislation actually says or neither are there um, huge changes, variations that you can take uh, from that legislation but there are some but that wouldn't change because of this legislation? No, because it, it wouldn't. It would still be governed no, it by... Wouldn't. it wouldn't change. No. Can I then ask um, some questions around um, kind of nutrition, health promotion? And I think what um, you had said was that the Food Standards Scotland could lead the way in looking at um, health-related issues such as obesity, but that falls within the remit of local government and within NHS boards throughout the country. What is in the bill to make sure that those organisations work together? Because it seems to me that this could be bringing another layer um, in where there are a number of agencies all trying to do the same work, um, and health promotion is already a duty um, placed on health boards and, and local government. How would Food Standards Scotland interact with those bodies to make sure that they're all, I suppose, singing from the same hymn sheet? Dr. Yes, uh, the, 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 the answer, answer to your question lies really in the question you, yourself and, and something that you said in the question. Um, there are a huge number of bodies that are involved in this, in this area. Um, and while we know a lot of the answers as to what to do with nutrition, the feeling I have and the SFAC has uh, is that there's a need for some coordination and making sure you, you get away from the kind of initiativitis, to use a word, um, where you get initiative on initiative on initiative, all good in themselves, but lacking some kind of leadership and coordination would be my judgment um, with this. And I think the role, and we've had some evidence of this from um, uh, various uh, speakers we've had at SFAC uh, uh, dealing with this. Um, so the, the answer to the question is, there is nothing in the bill that actually requires or demands uh, this kind of coordination. Um, there, there's nothing that says there'll be a directive to local authorities to be doing this or, or, or that or, or indeed any other body. But the issue really is, is, is providing that kind of, you know, in my view, that kind of national leadership to bring people together to say this is how we're going to go forward with an issue which is very large in terms of you know, improving nutrition in Scotland and clearly part of, um, part of the, the whole question of addressing obesity uh, as such. We heard quite a lot in the meetings that we've had in, in SFAC about needing to have um, that kind of coordination. I think we know what the answers are and what the prescriptions are. It's a question of seeing how they can be implemented. Um, and it's not a question of taking over, it's a question of trying to um, lead that debate and lead that implementation as such and bring people along. That's how I would see it. Sue Davis. Thank you. Um, I think it would be really important that there are lots of um, coordination mechanisms in place for different groups. So the the food, well, food Standards Scotland will have to be um, very collaborative in the way that it works with other groups. One of the key things, I think, is to make sure that it's got really strong consumer and public health representation on its board as well, so that gives a really strong signal as to what it's about and that it isn't there um, as a kind of industry promotion body because there's set other bodies that have that responsibility. We think there's an important role centrally to be 
um, promoting good practice and also incentivising changes across the food industry. So some work has started to happen that the Scottish Government is already doing. It started to try and look at food promotions, for example, but that hasn't got very far, whether that's promotions in um, supermarkets or promotions in takeaways or whatever. There's also a lot of work that still needs to be done around um, trying to reduce levels of fat, sugar and salt in products. And that's not going to be possible in everything, but a lot of work has been done on salt, but obviously there's a big focus on sugar at the moment. We published some research last week that shows that some savoury ready meals can have as much as 50 grams of sugar in them. So th there's lot, lots of scope to be looking at what can be done um, nationally, as well as then making sure what that actually means in terms of um, delivery on the ground at a local level. Is it, is it then missing from the bill that there's the powers to lead um, on, in this area, or is it something that is going to have to be set up by maybe um, memorandums of understanding, working together, looking at what role? I, I, can't, I can't see how Food Standards Scotland can take leadership in this area when other people have a statutory responsibility in this area um, unless they're empowered to do so. Yes, Dr. Yes, I, I mean, I, I'm expressing my, my own view with this, um, but I, I think, as you mentioned, it really is collaboration and memorandums and, of understanding, um, SLAs and, and, and various things along that line, to try to bring people together to, to, to grasp hold of, of, of this on a kind of national basis. And I think actually quite a lot can be achieved through that route by, by trying to, to bring people together. And I do accept that the statutory responsibility lies elsewhere uh, as such, but I don't think that needs to change to be able to get um, um, a better focused approach in this whole area. That, that would be my view um, um, uh, with this. I think if you sought to change uh, the, you know, the, the, the responsibility as such, I think that could be really a very fundamental change um, as such. Um, and I'm not sure that it would generate the kind of change that you would want. I think we know the answers to the issues, the, the, the obesity issues. The question is how best, how best to implement that and to... And to uh, I was going to say make people, but to, to encourage people to do the things they need to do, okay, to, to, addre to address the, the issues. And it feels to me much more like, you know, how do you implement this as opposed to where the powers lie? Uh, and the leadership is therefore, in my view, very important. I mean, it could fail, but um, that boils down to how that leadership actually operates. Uh, and that's true in, in, indeed in a, in, in a range of different things for this new body. It will need to work collaboratively in other areas as well, not least, for example, in the science and how that's, how that's carried forward. Um, uh, and on things like the regulation and enforcement, which is a responsibility also of the local authorities, although there is some national responsibility in relation to the EU with that as well. So there is a kind of shared type responsibility with some of this that, that really boils down to saying, well, we really need to all be working in the same direction under the same kind of leadership and recognise how important these particular issues are and addressing problems together in a way. And that's how I see this body actually working. Um, no, I suppose it's just to reinforce. I mean, I think, I think it does need to take a leadership role on these issues, and I think the the powers that it has to operate openly and transparently, and also to publish the advice that it gives, will be really important in making sure that it does that. Um, and you know, I think it's important that it takes a strong role and sets out exactly what action it expects to be taken and then can use its powers to name and shame and highlight who is and isn't doing it. So in areas, even if it doesn't actually have the ability to legislate, it can still make sure that it's delivering change across the whole of the industry. Does anyone get any other comments in terms of, we got some evidence about the, the board and the board membership and the, the, the composition and that, or you mentioned it, Sue, Did, has anyone else got any comments on if I, could, of the board. if I could just perhaps comment in a general sense, yes. I think it's important, reference has been made to having the right structure, the right representation on the board, uh, including health representation, consumer representation. 
I would just make a general comment that I think it would be important to have appropriate food sector representation on the board as well, so that there's a general understanding of how the industry itself operates and can take that to the table. Uh, all of that uh, is underpinned by putting consumer interests first, but I think it's important the board is as widely based as possible in its views and experience, and, and perhaps a, a maximum number of seven is something that uh, should be looked at a bit more. Yes, I, I would agree with that. I wondered about seven as being the maximum as well. I mean, there's, there's no definitive answer to this, but it just seemed to me to be a, to be a bit on the small side. Um, I think it's also very important, however, um, that the people who are on the board do not represent their particular sector as, as such they are in the public interest as such, and that's written into the governance of, of this bill. And it seems to me that's very important that consumers come first, and that while people come from an industry interest, um, or from a nutrition interest, or from a public health interest, that they're, they're working collectively to come to a decision that is in the public interest as such, not in the interest of individual sectors as, as such. And that's indeed how the FSA board works. And I think that um, that arrangement should apply as well, and indeed is implicit within, within the bill itself. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think it would be very dangerous to start to have different industry sectors represented on the board promoting their own particular interests, because I think that would move it away from the public health and consumer focus that it needs. Um, I think it, it should be clearer in the bill that members of the board are there to act in the public interest and that they shouldn't have any conflicts of interest. That doesn't mean that they don't have relevant experience and skills, but overall they should be there, as Jim said, to, to act together in the public interest. Um, separately to my which role, I, um, I'm the chair of the management board of the European Food Safety Authority. And that comes under a huge amount of scrutiny in terms of its ability to provide independent advice and make sure that it's really making decisions that are in the public interest and aren't about promoting the food industry. So I think the composition of the board and um, making sure that there's you know, very clear procedures in place for how it acts independently um, will be really important for making sure that the body has credibility. Bob Doris. Thanks, well, thanks convener. Well, that's quite helpful that um, the convener has picked up some of the corporate governance issues because it allows me to, to go to the nuts and bolts of, of the bill. But I suppose it as a slight aside, it, it's quite useful, maybe not, not at this evidence session, but to get a small note on European uh, food safety standards and traceability and, and, and welfare and that kind of thing. Because I think given we've just finished European elections, it's quite good to see the positive role that the European Union can, can, can play. And I think that's important to put on the record, not one for today, but maybe one for um, a, a, another day. Um, I, so the nuts and bolts of of the bill. I was kind of I'll, I'll kind of put this in kind of language that I understand rather than necessarily the policy memorandum of the bill. But my understanding would be that if um, trading standards, the local authority found uh, 100 pairs of fake Nike trainers, they could seize them. Um, they, they could they could be destroyed. Um, but if you find a batch of, of food where there's been food fraud, but the food is deemed to be safe, but been passed off as something that it otherwise is not. Uh, sheriffs do not have the power to order the destruction of that food. And my understanding of the bill is this will bring in provision for those powers. That's quite a glaring omission, that um, you know, fraud in consumer goods that's non-food can be seized and destroyed, but when it's food, it can't be. Now, that's my understanding of the bill. Can I just double-check that that, that that is the power that's going to be given in relation to this bill? And are all three of the witnesses content that the, the mechanisms within the bill is sufficient to achieve that aim? Yes, Sue? Yeah, I think what's really good about the bill is that it's extending a lot of the provisions that have only applied to food safety to what's termed as food information in the bill. So, as you say, that will include the power to seize... Um, products that aren't labelled properly, that are, that are misleading or, or fraudulent. Um, but there's also other measures such as introducing fixed penalty notices and compliance notices that have previously only been possible for food safety breaches um, rather than food standards breaches. So we think that's really important. We'd also like to see an additional power added, which is one that 
um, Scudamore, which I was on as well for both of the Scudamore reports, where we recommended that there was also um, the power for um, the body to require food industry testing and the disclosure of testing results as well, um, to make sure that you know, when, a, when a situation does arise where there's a um, potential fraud, that they, you know, the, it's not just going to rely on everybody's goodwill. You know, even though that may work in some circumstances, it's not always going to work. So we think that's one area where it could be strengthened further. Do you mind if I ask a supplementary on that specific community before the other two witnesses come in? No, go if, on. if that's okay. Now, would the, the duty to disclose food industry testing, would that be a standard duty? Uh, would it be a duty that could be imposed by a, a sheriff that was dealing with, with an issue through the courts? How, 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 would you see that, how would you see that working? Well, I think the problem um, that arose within Horsemeat was that the Food Standards Agency didn't have the power to enter many of the premises and didn't have the power to actually require the food industry to do testing when it realised that there was a problem. Um, they managed to get a voluntary agreement with the food industry to do more testing. So this would be for that kind of situation to make sure that um, when the Food Standard, when Food Standards Scotland needed them to do the testing, that it could do that. And I would assume that if you know, if they couldn't, if that wasn't then done, then that could be a criminal offence. Okay, that's very helpful. Sorry, gentlemen, I can cut you off there before you come in. Mr. Welgus, Dr. Welgus. Yes, thank, thank you. I, I, the, 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 the detail of this would really be for the lawyers as such in terms of the actual detail, but my understanding is very similar to, to Sue's understanding um, with this, that what's happening is that for food standards, the same provisions as currently apply for food safety as such in the Food Safety Act um, will apply to standard as well. My slight doubt with this, and this might need to be checked, is about the destruction of the food. This food certainly can be seized, and there are various other regulatory elements that go into standards. Um, but I, I'm just not quite sure. I was trying to look there to see whether it was there. But I, I, that point perhaps just needs to be checked with the lawyers as to whether there's destruction uh, involved with this. Um, could I just mention one other thing? Um, the standard stuff is really very important in terms of the, of the additional regulatory arrangements that exist with this, and some of it's enabling powers rather than actual powers itself. And so it will be for decision how those powers will actually be implemented in consultations, etc., and FSS will be responsible for that. Um, so it's not the end of the story in terms of the detail of how this will work. It will really come down to uh, some of the secondary legislation that will be involved that therefore take, take up the, those powers as such. The other important thing, and, and, and Sue mentioned it, is, of course, um, uh, ensuring authenticity and standards uh, is essentially an international type thing, or it can be an international type thing. So um, some of the legislation here will not pick that up and cannot pick that up because it needs to be carried on at an international level, an EU level um, or whatever, to ensure that you know, very, long, um, uh, very long chains, processing chains, um, are properly regulated. And that's a, a key feature um, that follows from the horse meat. And indeed, uh, we're waiting to see a little bit about how governments will actually respond to reports, etc., that are out Scudamore and Elliot uh, and all of that, to see how these things might be taken forward. That is a very important element, given how uh, some of this stuff in horse meat has demonstrated how international um, um, some of this, these problems actually are. Okay, uh, that's helpful. Mr. Donaldson, did you have anything to add in relation to that? I have nothing to add to that. Right. That's covered can, can, it comprehensively. Sort of, thank you, Mr. Donaldson. Can I just clarify then, because I, 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 I'm, I, the policy memorandum that, that I was looking at, uh, is, is there examples then of um, where the food information, where the labelling of whatever has been wrong, where authorities have stepped in, they've seized the food, um, that they've wished to make sure that that food was not put back in, if you like, to the consumer food chain, even though it's safe, just wrong food information or food fraud, but it then still re-enters uh, um, the, the world of the consumer. Because from reading the policy memorandum, it would suggest that that's a possibility, as the law currently stands, where sheriffs don't have the power to, to keep the food. So if they seize the food, it's perfectly safe. It's not breaking any laws other than food information or food fraud. It has to be returned. Is, is that the current situation? Because that's what the policy memorandum was suggesting. Because I found that quite staggering. I just want to be clear in my own head that that is the situation. Yes, Doctor. 
that is my understanding uh, of the position that there was a, a gap in, in the legislation as such. Now, okay. I'm not a lawyer uh, as such, and I haven't looked in the great detail of this, but that is my understanding. And the detail would need to be checked with the lawyers to be clear, but I'm pretty sure the memorandum will have been you know, produced by, by lawyers, and that, that will be the position, but that's my understanding. No, that, that, that's fine. Now, it's in terms of um, this process, the nuts and bolts of the bill as well, what contained within the bill is the, the duty uh, to report uh, breaches of food standards or, or food information, or which doesn't um, exist at the moment. So my understanding would be if you ran a, a small business and you you sought to enter into an agreement to to get some 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 food produce and then realised that um, it wasn't legit. There was no duty on you to then report that to the relevant authorities, and and, and a, a good small business would walk away and deal with a legitimate supplier. But there was no compelling of that business. Uh, that that compulsion will now be contained within the bill. It will be an offence not to report that. Is that something that all three of you are content? Are you content with the provisions within the bill in relation to that? Yeah. Ms Davis. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, we were really pleased that that was in the bill. Um, I think it shows that... Stand well, it, it, it makes it clear that standards are a really important issue. And I think it's something that... Um, I mean, it came out within Scudamore, but it's something that Elliot's interim report and horse meat has also highlighted, where he's expressed concern that there's been a culture within the industry... Um, you know, the industry globally, to often turn a blind eye or people um, buying ingredients at prices that couldn't possibly um, be realistic. And so I think it starts to change that culture and make it clear that you know, fraudulent practices are completely unacceptable. OK, now, uh, does anyone anything to add in relation to that specific matter? OK, now... Simply, uh, have a supplementary. Yeah. We've got a couple of supplementaries, if you want to take them first. I've got Richard Lyles. Is that a supplementary on this, Richard? No, actually, I had another question. Uh, that's okay, then. You've got a supplementary? Yes. One of the things that was being suggested to us yesterday was that the ability to uh, fine somebody or punish them for fraud was really quite inadequate related to the profits that were being made by criminal, act criminal activity. Uh, and I just wonder whether you feel the bill has the scope or the regulations may have the scope to, in, to ensure adequate punishment of criminal activity where it is clearly highly profitable. Yes? Well, this is something that's being debated at EU level where the European Parliament's been considering the official controls regulation and that's going to be finalised when the new Commission and, and Parliament come back um, in the autumn. But um, the Commission had proposed that um, the fine should um, be... Sort of equivalent to the, the cost of the financial gain from the criminal activity. And the Parliament has suggested it should be actually double the financial gain from the criminal activity, which is something that, that we would support. We think you, know, you, you need a whole range of enforcement tools, and so the fixed penalty notices will help, um, you know, the, the requirement um, to, to disclose cases of fraud. But ultimately, you need that criminal route, and you need tough, tough penalties as well. So um, I think it, it needs to be ensured that, there, that well, as I understand it, that would obviously be reflected in the bill, but that it's really important that there is that, in, that provision within it. Yes, I have nothing very much more to add to that. I, I, I think it's generally recognised that, that the penalties, the financial penalties that exist in this, in this area are very much less than those that exist for contraventions outside the food, the food area where they really can be punitive. Uh, and I think what's happening is, as Sue has said, is that this is being looked at at EU level to see what kind of level of penalties um, um, are appropriate in this instance. And then I, I would expect things would change uh, depending on, on arrangements uh, or decisions within, within the EU. In, I'm, I'm pleased we're trying to ascertain the nuts and bolts of the general support or concerns that you may have, and I'm glad there's support in relation to the duty to report non-compliance. The terminology in the bill is for food business operators. I'm ju just wondering, um, are you content with the scope of that? I, I, I mean, I, I'm wondering, are there others who could be aware of non-compliance who wouldn't have a duty to report, who should have a duty to report? I mean, I have to say, um, many years ago, I was a a kitchen porter in a hotel er earning peanuts, quite frankly. I wouldn't have wanted to put minimum wage staff in, 
in catering kitchens who were a, in, a, in an invidious situation to have a duty to report. There's a balance to be struck, of course. So is, but I'm just wondering um, whether or not food business operator is clearly defined or whether it should be widened out. I'm not sure I necessarily agree that it should be widened out. But I think it's an important question to ask in relation to that. So are we clear what we mean by a food business operator and should the scope of that be widened out in terms of a duty to report? Mr Donaldson, do you, do you yep, see your light on? Oh, right. <laughs> I wasn't aware it was on, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer, but uh, certainly from a food business operator point of view, it's appropriate that they take responsibility for their actions. I don't think anybody would have any disagreement whatsoever with that. And I think in terms of sanctions, just slightly impinging on the last question, uh, there are different tools in the box. And, and where there's a major fraud, then some of the levels mentioned in here would be less than adequate. And I think that's what Sue's saying is being considered as a wider EU level at the moment. Yeah, be Dr. Wilgus and then Sue Davis. Yes, just, just to say, food business operator is actually uh, a well-defined term in, in, in legislation as such. And in fact, it is the responsibility of the food business operator to ensure safe food and food of a standard. So that, that's where the responsibility actually lies. Um, I, I, to be honest, I hadn't really thought further than that in terms of, of, of who else would be, that might be involved. But uh, there are also um, ideas for whistleblowing, etc., cetera, on, on these things. And this is really more the kind of issue that would be in a code of practice or would be a, a standard approach to things um, as to how these, these things would be handled. And there, there are plenty of cases of, of you, you know, uh, secure phone lines, etc., this kind of thing. And it's the kind of thing that I would expect uh, FSS to look at um, and I think actually FSA are looking at that now in terms of, in terms of um, whistleblowing, etc., which I think really is the issue you're referring to. I think it would be dangerous um, to start um, changing that kind of definition because it really is central to the way the, the legislation actually works. Okay, Davis. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, a, it's a good point, and it would be worth checking that there isn't anybody important that it is excluded because... Um, with the horse meat incident, um, there's obviously these, all these brokers that suddenly emerged that people weren't necessarily aware of before. So to make sure that the different intermediaries are actually covered within this definition, definition of food business operators. But I think, as Jim was saying, it will also be really important that the new body has really effective ways of gathering intelligence more generally. This was something that Scudamore recommended um, in terms of, I think, getting better at that sort of economic analysis. So horse meat was obviously missed, but somebody should have been working out that horse was very similar to beef and that it was much cheaper than beef and therefore there was the potential for substitution. And trying, and I know it's very difficult, but trying to anticipate where there are other areas that criminals are likely to be making gains, as well as looking at wider surveillance. But also, it's often a difficult issue, but how you get the more informal intelligence from the food industry where there might be rumours of particular types of fraud taking place. Okay, that's helpful. Convener, I'll, I'll maybe come back in later on, but my colleagues wish to get in just now. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, Richard Simpson, followed by Richard. Yes, um, the food, uh, Scottish Food Advisory Committee at the moment exists and puts an input to the UK FSA. Will the Scottish Food Advisory Committee continue after the creation of the, 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 um, the new body? Yes. Yeah, the, the simple answer to that is no, it won't. It, fin it ceases at the time of vesting day of, of, of the new body. Uh, these arrangements, therefore, will cease uh, as such. Th these were arrangements to allow uh, a Scottish input to be put into UK decisions uh, on food safety, and that will wholly be taken over by FSS following vesting day. So, right, so, F so what's at the moment the difference between the food standards... The food standards agency in Scotland is... And I realise there's a subsection of the old Food Standards Agency UK. So you needed the separate body to make that input. I just, I just I mean, the new FSS will yeah. have that opportunity to make that input. Will yes, it? I mean, it's it just worth saying that, that uh, Food Standards, the Food Standards Agency Scotland, is simply uh, the Scottish end, executive end of the FSA yeah. um, as such. And so. Um, all its line management separate. and all things comes from, from the, the centre headquarters of, of FSA. 
Um, what will happen following uh, uh, vesting day is it will be an entirely separate body and, and it will be self-contained uh, as such. The arrangements we've had hitherto have been simply arrangements to look after Scottish interests within a UK setting. So, just to amplify that, in terms of the evidential base for the new FSS, I mean, they presumably will take evidence from Rowett, from the Cambridge unit, from the Norwich unit, uh -huh. uh, and elsewhere. But how can we ensure that the evidence that they're going to take and is going to be put in will, will in fact, you know, be compiled in a way that will be suitable? It's all about relationships. I mean, will we still yes. have yeah. access to Norwich and Cambridge? Yeah. Because I understand they're complementary to the Rowett. Yes. And are these this the is, only bodies? No, no. This is, this is a very fundamental point. In fact, th there are a, a number of scientific advisory committees which are UK-based, uh, but which also report to Scottish and Welsh and Northern Ireland, Irish ministers, uh, and they cover the whole gamut of possible... Um, uh, food safety or indeed um, uh, beyond food as well but some of them are, are solely food uh, some of them have a food remit but other remits as well they are standard scientific advisory committees and they are charged with providing scientific advice the best scientific advice that they can get um, uh, into the Food Standards Agency. And, and so when issues arise that require scientific advice as, as such, uh, frequently um, they will provide the scientific advice uh, into that. For example, there's an advisory committee on the microbiological safety of food. They've been very heavily involved in an issue recently to do with raw milk uh, sales uh, and giving advice uh, on that. And there are nine or ten of those committees, and it's really important the FSS has got access to that advice and can ask questions within that forum. And that's very much uh, in memorandums of understanding type territory. And one of the issues that will be, uh, I assume, being worked up now in terms of ready for vesting day uh, and will need to be uh, ready to go then so that when there's an issue in Scotland that requires scientific advice, uh, that that advice is made available uh, to the FSS. Now, that's not to say that there shouldn't also be coordination with the very considerable um, research um, uh, capabilities in Scotland itself. A number of those, of course, already feed into these scientific advisory committees, but you could see a role for uh, something separate happening um, uh, in Scotland as well in terms of scientific advice. And indeed, one of the issues that SFAC looked at quite closely was how that might work uh, for Scotland uh, with the FSS giving advice to the, to the new body as such. And there are issues, for example, like um, having a chief scientist responsible for the science, um, how uh, bodies like the Rowett and various other research bodies um, around Scotland would actually link into that. And these are crucial issues because food safety relies crucially on uh, having the correct science, the best science available to take decisions. Thank you, Kate. Um, I didn't have much to add, actually. It was just to say, I think that there are the existing scientific committees, and so it would be really important that there's a clear, um, well, there's a clear agreement about how that's going to operate <coughs> to make sure that they are going to pick up Scottish-specific issues. Um, and it may be that the new food body will have to set up its own committees on particular issues and then we would want it to work in the same way that the FSA has where the FSA makes sure that they meet in public, you know, there's strict criteria around independence and I think particularly when um, we're in a situation now where a lot of universities are relying on food industry funding for the research that they do, we need to make sure that there isn't going to be any um, well the independence of the research isn't going to be compromised or there's no any perception that its independence will be compromised as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, the, the, we're doing this bill at a, quite a difficult time in the sense that, you know, after September the 18th, we may be independent. And I just wonder whether there's, you know, the bill would have to be adjusted even further or, or what would happen in the event of independence as to how we would link to these quite integrated systems at the present time. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice question, shall, shall we say, with, with this, a very important uh, question as such. I mean, it would be really quite a difficult process and costly process to duplicate. I think we're talking about 12 or 15 committees as such of, of key experts uh, who, who, 
who uh, sit and pronounce on a range, right across the range of scientific uh, involvement in, in terms of duplicating that. Um, that's why I think it's, it, it's important to latch into that from FSS. Now, um, following September, I don't know what, what arrangements might apply, uh, but I would have thought it was important to try to get single scientific advice on issues and not have competing advice um, as such with this and that some sort of accommodation I mean it's all been publicly funded that, 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 that advice anyway and it's all in the public domain um, as such um, I, think it's, uh, I think it would need to be considered how that would be how that would be um, um, maintained shall, shall we say and how that advice was, was uh, obtained after uh, a, a yes vote in September, for example, uh, that would be quite an important issue because there are some quite big, <coughs> excuse me, scientific issues there. You know, if you think of BSE, for example, and that kind of issue now, we hope we don't have that again, but you need good scientific advice to tackle that kind of issue, and you need it for other things as well, actually, and so that's essential that that happens. I might just say one other thing about that. <coughs> With the machinery of government changes that occurred in 2010, the important advisory committee on nutrition, scientific advisory committee on nutrition, SACN, actually became part of the health, um, uh, the Department of Health down south and has now moved on to Health Protection England, I think it is. Uh, um, Public Health England. Public Health England, yeah, I got that wrong. Um, <coughs> and so it does not meet in public. It's internal and there may be an issue there may be an issue about doing something specific in Scotland about the scientific advisory committee on nutrition um, that really boils down to just how the new body would want to work um, with that the access that's available but given how important and how significant nutrition is likely to be for this for this new body uh, there is a question to be to be asked about that but these are not things specifically for provisions for the bill as such. They are things for provision as to how the new body will actually work and it will be for memoranda of understanding. I just, just wanted to add to that as well. I mean, a lot of advice now comes from the European Food Safety Authority and that's the basis of a lot of the EU legislation and approvals of particular types of products or setting safe levels for chemical contaminants, whatever. So it would be important that there's a, a close relationship and <coughs> obviously that would change depending on what happens in September, but also relationships with other bodies like World Health Organization as well are going to be important. So Donaldson? Well, that's an important point and, and it's one that's going to require real consideration uh, to make sure that uh, we can find the best way forward that enhances what the, the Food Standard Scotland role will be. I'm going to take on just a, just a wee bit because uh, the, the response um, from uh, the, the, the respondents to, to cons consultation and call for evidence, you know, were raising the whole issue about the body being properly resourced. Um, and yesterday we had some uh, issues about the current situation in respect of it, September 18 about the, the science and how that can be done. But I think that's been covered. Um, the direction and funding of research and who would be deciding these priorities was, was a bit of a, um, not, not, but an issue that was, that was, was raised um, about how the relationships with Throughit and others, uh, for instance, how we would get a balance there. Um, have we got any views on that in terms of resource? We, we, I think their budget they described yesterday was about £11 million. They were currently um, negotiating um, back from the UK body around £5 million. So we're talking about this new body that was having um, um, you know, a, an influence in this whole area. The focus for all of this area, we have a budget of about £16 million. Any comments, uh, Dr Wilgood? <laughs> Yes, I mean, I, I, I think the whole um, area of research and access to research and research commissioning, etc., will need to be looked at very carefully by the new body. Um, I, I think um, we in SFAC have done a little bit of work on, uh, on this in, in really in preparation or to, to give to those who will be involved in, in, in constructing the new, um, the new arrangements. And there will need to be some 
uh, mechanism for linking in to Scottish-based scientific advice as such. Now, that will need to be done fairly carefully if, um, if access to the, scientific, the, me the main scientific advisory committees continues, because you would not want competing advice um, as such. Um, so, but I, I do see a role um, uh, for that uh, and setting up perhaps a separate committee in Scotland. Uh, and I, I notice, for example, that the bill allows for separate committees being constructed. And I think that's right, because there are um, other areas where that might be important as well. OK, with this. When it comes to funding, the amount of money available, research funding available to the FSA in Scotland is very modest compared with the requirement for scientific advice. And so collaboration um, and dealing with others, not least the Scottish Government itself in terms of the money it spends and, and other bodies, but the, not just the Scottish Government, but the research bodies, um, uh, the scientific research bodies across the UK, access to that money and collaboration with that will be fundamental in, in terms of getting uh, answers to some of the questions that are, that are raised. Um, in terms of a general issue on budgets, um, I, think, I think the budget that's been set and the documentation that you have looks to me to be on the low side with this, my personal, my personal opinion with this. The one issue I would, I would mention to you on this, however, um, is of course this body is going to be part of the Scottish administration and therefore will be part of the process of the allocation of funding in government you know, going forward. And if there's a need for more resources, then bids go in through that route um, um, with this. <coughs> so that's my, my general view. The, the issue of how um, future science provision, uh, or how there is future science provision to the uh, FSS, to my, in my view, is crucial. And this new body really needs to work hard uh, on that to make sure the right memoranda are around the right linkages and collaboration are made so that the right um, uh, uh, scientific advice and research comes forward. Any other responses? <coughs> um, just to add, in, in terms of the research budget, it may look small. Um, if I could say I was a board member of Quality Meet Scotland, they had a research budget of something like 300,000, but uh, they actually attracted additional funding, whether that was from a uh, Scottish government um, other sources, European sources, I think there's plenty of <coughs> mechanisms to actually build on the core funding and be led by where the, the scientific needs are and, and secure funding and down these particular routes. Sue Davis. Yeah, I think um, collaboration will be important where it's possible. And in many areas, you're, you're only going to have a limited number of experts in which to be drawing on. Um, as I mentioned before, I think making sure that the source of the funding is really clear, particularly when you're getting into more controversial areas like new food technologies where you need to make sure that you've got relying on independent research. And I think the scientific committee structure in terms of how you then assess the scientific evidence works well where you get a mix of people from multidisciplinary backgrounds who are weighing up um, what the evidence says and then providing advice. So... It, that it's obviously the existing um, food standards agency committees, as Jim was saying, but I think that it, where there are new areas, it's important to follow that model and look at how you can make sure that you've got the, uh, bringing together a, a real mix of people to get the best outcome. Do we know, just the, the interest of Mr Donaldson and indeed uh, Dr Wilgus's point, that the, um, there are individual budgets and different compartments, if you like, or different departments. Have we any idea about, uh, you know, what, what, what the global figure is? I mean, you know, we've mentioned the health service are looking at um, uh, some of this in light of obesity, and they're spending some money in research. The standards agency is also, others are. Is there a, a global figure that, 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 that uh, probably could be used more effectively if, if we were, look, you know, focusing on um, significant problems in Scotland? Yes, Dr. Well, um, I, I, I don't have a figure, and I'm, I'm not sure whether that exists somewhere. It may well, it may well exist uh, somewhere. But I, I can tell you, for, for example, there's a huge programme going on at the moment on E. coli. E. coli is a, a very important organism for Scotland. Yeah. We tend to have a much larger incidence in terms of shedding of, of E. coli from cattle than elsewhere in the world, actually, or certainly in the UK. Uh, and there is a big programme, a, a lot of Scottish Government money in that. 
it's not just FSA yeah. money, a lot of Scottish Government so money, all, and there may be Research Council money in that um, also uh, as a particular thing. And I would envisage in the future looking at things and trying to bring together collaborations to look at issues that are very important for Scotland. I mean, you could envisage, for example, um, uh, that kind of thing being important for the shellfish industry, very important for Scotland, uh, and perhaps for some other areas as well. But that boils down to how uh, how Food Standards Scotland would take that agenda forward yeah. as such. The, the, the question was not just the summer money it would be available, this question of uh, Sue, Sue Davis raised mm -hmm. about the independence of that yes. this research. There were some yeah. concerns, general concerns raised about that. Yeah, have you any comment on that? I think we, that would be a perfectly sensible comment. Uh, I think it just underlines the importance of FSS uh, being independent and transparent, and, and funding sources should be very clear. I don't think anybody would have an issue with that. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry for coming so often um, with this, but there, there is one of the committees that's on a UK basis as a General Advisory Committee on Science, and that's a, a, a new development, well, new over the last sort of five or six years, I think. Um, and it looks at issues to do with the arrangements of science um, as such, and will do things like uh, look at the use of um, industry-led data, et cetera, and has done some work on that kind, of, that kind of thing. Now, I'm not aware of it having done something to do with um, uh, access to funds through, through uh, industry, but in other words, it does quite an important procedural role in terms of how these kind of issues would work across the scientific advisory committees and across the research establishments. And I think that role is actually quite important for addressing the very question that you, uh, you raise about industry, you know, industry money coming in in certain areas and, and use of industry data as well, which is another issue. Who would decide the priority in the budget? Would well, it be that board? Would it be the, the, the influence of well, the government? What, what, would it be... uh, yeah, what, what has tended to happen is that the, the, the General Advisory Committee on Science has, has produced guidelines or, or procedures to use um, in particular areas. The one I remember is the use of data from, from um, other industry um, sources and how that can be handled, best handled in research, so that it's seen to be independent <coughs> and objective, etc. And is, is there, are you all satisfied that the terms of the bill would cover any and ensure independence? And would that be the memorandum? Yes, you do. Well, I think a lot of that is left to the next stage to be sorted out through some of the memoranda. And I think um, that's why I was saying that I think the bill could be a bit, well, needs to be more explicit around some of the issues such as the makeup of the board and avoiding conflicts of interest, although, you know, there will be more general requirements around, you know, ethics in public life or whatever. But um, we think the more that the bill can be explicit about those kinds of issues, the better, because I think as we found with the Food Standards Agency and the Food Standards Act, some of the things that are left a little bit ambiguous, you know, as things change and priorities change, they can easily be weakened in later years. A supplementary on this, Bob? Yeah, just a very brief one. I, I thought uh, Dr. Wilgus gave a really balanced answer in relation to uh, how you get the best scientific advice when necessary. And obviously, the, your answer was you, you go to the preeminent person or committee that has that advice, irrespective of whether it's Scotland, the rest of the UK, or Europe, and you do that. Uh, the more I heard about funding, whether it was via uh, the Scottish Government or whether it was via UK research councils, whether it was via Europe, um, dare, dare I say, got slightly excited, if that's the right expression to use, about the opportunities that are out there. And could Food Standards Scotland um, be ahead of the curve in working with higher education institutions and others to scope out, say, for example, Horizon 2020, the European £80 billion fund for research and innovation, to identify areas of future research and be a bit more proactive and identifying what the next big thing in terms of research is and getting funds for it and being progressive in relation to that. Would that be a rebit you would see for Food Standards Scotland? Because there's a lot of money swishing about there, particularly at a European-wide level, that I would want to make sure Scotland's research institutions can access. And would Food Standards Scotland have a role in relation to doing some of that partnership work? Yes, Sue David. 
Yeah, I think it is really important that it's linked in and takes the opportunities where it can. Um, because I think, as Jim was saying, there's lots of the same discussions happening in lots of different places. So the European Commission had a workshop on tackling Campylobacter a couple of weeks ago, for example, that Campylobacter is the main type of food poisoning still. Um, and the Food Standards Agency is having a, a workshop about that next week. So I think some of these things where you've got the same experts looking at different issues, it's important to work together. Um, in one of the initial consultations about the new food body, it was asked whether the um, whether FSS should have a role coordinating all food research. And we were a bit concerned about that because, quite rightly, a lot of the stuff that comes out of Horizon 2020 will be about agricultural promotion, about food industry promotion, about developing new types of products, which is important but isn't core to the work that FSS does. So I think it's important to make that distinction so it takes the opportunities where it can but doesn't then get distracted or compromised by going into different areas. Yes, well, yes, it's really just to say yes to, in answer to the question that you posed. I do think FSS could have a, a role in, in, in leading the curve, so to speak, on certain issues. Um, I think it boils down to how they, how they work, and, and it's not something for the legislation, obviously, but uh, the way things work. I think they will also need to choose what the issues are, because they won't be able to do everything, uh, obviously. But I do think there are certain things where uh, they could be uh, seen to be promoting excellence in certain areas. Thank you very much. Haley McLeod. I think that was one of the questions I was going to ask was around the um, Horizon 2020, because I wanted to come back to our, obviously, our relationship um, with the European Union. I mean, clearly, I know it's not part and parcel with, with the bill, but given how important um, that relationship is with much of the legislation that comes um, from the EU around the food policy uh, legislation. I mean, one of the first questions I wanted to ask was how much, actually, how much EU legislation, what the percentage is that comes from the EU um, that the FSA is uh, dealing with. But also was to ask the question about how do you see the new body developing or enhancing its relationship further with the EU institutions, um, not just with the Commission and the Council, but also the European Parliament, because the European Parliament has a very important role uh, to play in this area, given it's, it's a co-legislator with, with the Council and a lot of the, the, uh, the food safety legislation. But it was also um, the fact that there had been concerns that had been raised in the written evidence about ensuring you know, that the new body has got an effective voice um, within you know, a, an early stage of the EU policy-making process and that we're able to put forward you know, Scottish-specific concerns. And given the fact that the new body will have a a new role um, to include diet and nutrition. So how do you kind of see that? Because obviously, for the moment, the UK remains a key, you know, the key avenue of, of uh, influence for Scotland to be able to have its say on European legislation. Yes. Yeah, I think, well, pretty much all food safety and food labelling legislation is decided at European level. There is a certain amount of flexibility about implementation around that. So there's been a big um, piece of food labelling legislation that was adopted a couple of years ago, the food information regulations. And that covers everything from country of origin labelling to how meat products are labelled to nutrition labelling. And so the traffic light labelling scheme is a voluntary scheme that has been developed following that. There's also slight flexibility at the moment in that the, um, some national provisions around meat products and how things like... Um, the, um, how much meat you have in sausages and pies and things like that, whether some of those reserved descriptions are retained. So there is a little bit of flexibility, but generally it's all at European level. But as you said, I think the, the real scope and where there is the most potential to be doing things differently is in the diet and health area, mm -hmm. where some aspects of that are covered by sort of EU policy initiatives, but they're more guidance rather than regulation. And a lot of that is really about encouraging and incentivising industry to do things as well as um, regulating where there, there is the potential. Um, I think the relationship with the EU bodies will be important, and again, I think it's going to depend on what happens with the referendum. Um, at the moment, it's obviously the... Um, the Food Standards Agency is the UK competent authority, so it's the Food Standards Agency that would um, be represented on EFSA's advisory forum and on the standing committee on um, the food chain and animal health. So it's, um, it would be important 
to make sure through these memorandum of understanding, as exists already, that there's a clear role for FSS in inputting into those positions, particularly where policy is being developed. But I think the more informal relationships as well will obviously be important. So EFSA does a lot of work on emerging risks, for example, so it's going to be important to make sure that there's a two-way two flow of information into that as well. Could I, could I just, sorry, could I just add to that that I, I agree entirely with that. I mean, more than 90% of the legislation will be EU-based as such. But in terms of the policy development, um, you'll be aware of how the EU works as such. Ideas flow around Brussels and, and, and Luxembourg for a long time before they actually become legislation. And there's an opportunity to influence that in that process. And when we put our consultation um, response into the, to the consultation um, exercise uh, earlier on, uh, one of the issues that we identified was, was, um, was having secondments from the, from the body in Scotland across the European institutions to be being on the spot is really important in terms of how those discussions go forward and influencing things. Um, and that would be our view, that, that having... Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, a more or less formalised view of how secondments would work mm -hmm. is very important in influencing um, and s just getting information back actually as to what's actually going on and where the key things are it is very important for this body but it, again it's really just linking with what Sue said about having the right memoranda of understanding and SLAs the formal position currently uh, is set out in, in memoranda already in terms of uh, the UK represented yeah. in, in, in Brussels, and, and that's there. Um, if that, if, if we, we have a yes vote in September, no doubt that changes, and it changes the, the, the ground rules with this, but currently we work within those. But there are certain informal channels that are very important uh, with this, and as I say, secondments seem to me to be very uh, important for uh, that information flow and influencing, and this new body, uh, I think, would have an opportunity to do that. And I think, sorry, I think the comments is a very good idea, but I guess it's also making sure we get access to all the relevant kind of advisory and scientific committees, not just with the UK level, but also with the yes, EU indeed. as well. Yeah, the same point, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Richard Lyle, I think, is the thank you, convener. next um, last question. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, convener. Uh, uh, interesting uh, points you made, and, and, and this is not a question, just a, a comment back. Um, you said that bugs no, no um, um, border, so at the end of the day, whatever happens in September, we shall uh, work with, uh, I'm sure the English and the Scottish agencies will work together with each other. And also my other comment is that there are many universities who are doing research, food research out there. And it just doesn't need to be research done at the FSS. But anyway, I'll come on to the question which I want to, uh, it hasn't been covered. Local authorities, uh, environmental health officers, um, uh, and can I identify that for 15 years I was a, a, a manager in a, a grocery shop and also I was a, a previously a councillor and came across uh, environmental health officers who uh, were extremely committed in order to ensure food safety and also to ensure that the public were safe. So I'd, I'd like to go into a comment, I think, which was which was attributed to which, um, and, and, and you may dispute this or, or, or you may agree with it, that you, you noted there were great variation across local authorities in the effective of enforcement of food law, and you argue that the FSS should oversee and coordinate this to ensure consistent standards. Um, what did, you, did you say that, or did you mean that? And also, what would you suggest that the, the FSS or... Um, with the greatest respect to environmental health officer who uh, I know have worked extremely well in order to safeguard the public in their local areas, why did you suggest that they um, need to be more effective? Thank you. Um, yes, we did say that, and it was based on some research that we did that we published in January, where we were conscious that local authority resources are under a lot of pressure. And so we looked at how local authorities were carrying out hygiene enforcement and looked at, we, we basically ranked local authorities across the UK, taking into account the level of compliance that they were managing to achieve in high and medium risk premises so that 
we, we didn't look at the lower risk ones because we appreciated that they were having to prioritise. And then also looked at how proactively they were trying to address that where there was non-compliance by looking at how many of their planned interventions had been achieved and whether or not they were getting around to rating new premises. And that showed that there was real variation around the country. So um, Westburn Dunbartonshire, for example, had around 50% compliance, whereas um, others such as Orkney Islands, Edinburgh had, um, had sorry, yeah, Orkney Islands and North Lanarkshire had um, much higher levels of compliance. And it was a similar picture across the whole of the UK. And we appreciate that a lot of local authorities are doing a, a really good job. Um, but I think it shows that there are real variations in the resources that they have available to them, but also the nature of the premises that they're dealing with. So some of the cities may have a big turnover of premises that are constantly opening and trying to keep on top of that can be difficult. And we appreciate that it's something that you know, is a local authority responsibility, but it seems that there's a need for it to take a more strategic look so that you know, it's not just a bit of a lottery whether you're living in an area where your local authority has really cut back and is having difficulty getting around to doing food hygiene work or food standards work, or you live in one where they've got 97% compliance rates. And we would see the, food, uh, food, the new food body as having an important role in, in looking at which are the struggling local authorities and supporting them, looking at what types of food business there are and how you can match the expertise that you've got within the environmental health profession to make sure that you've got better coverage across the country. And I think in Scotland, where you've got 32 local authorities, there are already good mechanisms for coordinating them. So there's the Scottish Food Enforcement Liaison Committee, for example, but we would see this as being a more proactive role compared with what the Food Standards Agency has been doing up till now. Yes, it, it seems to me this is, a, this is a very important issue as well. I keep saying they're important issues, but this one also, this linkage, because the vast majority of businesses that require regulation are regulated through uh, local authorities um, as such. Uh, and while it is their responsibility, there is a, a kind of overall responsibility to Scotland to ensure that there is compliance with the legislation um, as such. So it, it is important. I think the key thing that that um, Sue mentioned there was the pressure on resources uh, and you can see that. I, I go around um, in the job I do currently I, and I see environmental health um, departments and I, I would very much agree with you that they're very committed um, um, people in doing this but I, I do also see cuts around and, 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 and lots of uh, of change and, and, and churn and experience leaving, uh, you know, with older people leaving, etc. Experience and that itself can have an effect um, uh, on the operation uh, of uh, of that regulatory activity. And I think the new food body will need to look at this very carefully, the model that exists, and look at much more collaboration, use of resources, etc., in collaboration with the local authorities. Back to the same kind of issue that I mentioned earlier with nutrition. Um, much more of a, 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 a kind of collaborative effort in terms of making sure that the right things are done at the right time. Um, and I think it's still possible to do that under declining budgets, but it needs to be looked at very carefully. That's a key thing. I do not see that issue of declining budgets going away anytime soon. And so this needs to be looked at. I'm involved a bit with looking at audits of local authority um, uh, achievement of what they're, what they're doing in terms of compliance with the legislation. And it is clear that there is pressure in certain areas. I think there's greater pressure uh, on the food standards side uh, because of the resources than there is on the environmental health side. But there is pressure on both sides and that will need to be addressed by the new food body. Well, just one, I think the NHS Lothian mentioned in terms of surveillance, you know, there is a lot of surveillance inspection about food hygiene and et cetera, but there's, I think they made the point um, there isn't any in terms of uh, dietary surveillance, what's in there, and maybe that should be a role for the, just to broaden that, 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 that issue out, is, is there views there? Is, is that a function of the S S FSA already, and why isn't it going to be? There is um, already some quite, quite good information um, available under various surveys that are done. They tend to be done on a UK basis, and Scotland sometimes augments the sample to get, to get better information. That's, for example, the information... Uh, that is used to look at the dietary targets on salt, fat and sugar. Yes. So there, there, there is a fair amount of work. It is very expensive survey work to do, but 
uh, that is an area that, with responsibility for diets, that Food Standards Scotland should look at going, going forward as to whether that information and the stuff they get back on that um, is fit for purpose or whether more could be done um, in this area. Uh, it seems to me to be an important point as well. Can I thank you uh, very much on behalf of the committee for the, the time you've spent with us this morning and, uh, and the evidence you've provided. Thank you very much indeed um, to spend at this point and um, set up for the next panel. A big difference.
We now move to uh, agenda item number two and continue our uh, NHS board's budget scrutiny. And today we are taking evidence from a number of special NHS boards. And can I welcome on behalf of the committee Simon Belfer, uh, who is Director of Finance and Business Services, NHS National Services Scotland. Pamela McLaughlin, um, uh, Director of Finance and Logistics, the Scottish Ambulance Service. And Maggie Waterston, Director of Finance and Corporate Services, Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Welcome to you all. Um, in the interest of time uh, now, uh, we, we, we're going to move uh, directly to questions. And our first question this morning is from Richard Simpson. I'd like to open up by asking about planned efficiency savings, uh, which I know there's, there's not a target this year, though 3% is understood to be the continuing target. But I notice that Health Improvement, Healthcare Improvement Scotland is saying that it's planning efficiency savings of 5.6% and the ambulance service of 4% and national services 3%. So can you give us some examples? Um, and in particular, I'm really quite concerned about the where the savings are being made in terms of workforce, that HIS are saying 70% of the savings will be through workforce planning. And given the demand for the services of Health Improvement Scotland and inspection and monitoring, uh, I'm uh, slightly surprised that you're going to be able to make those savings. But I wonder if you could give us some examples on how you're actually going to do this and uh, which are cash savings and which are design savings. And um, I, I think um, when it, I, for Healthcare Improvement Scotland, we've obviously um, created our LDP, our local delivery plan for this year, and that has been resourced. Um, and the, we had um, a, a um, voluntary redundancy scheme two years ago, and some of those savings are recurring savings that have come through um, the last couple of years. And it's helped us to re-engineer the workforce that we have into... A, um, reinvesting in scrutiny. So, for example, we've put an extra half a million pounds into scrutiny in the last two years in order to enable it to do its, its work. So that would be a cash-releasing efficiency saving, which has um, allowed us to, to focus more on delivery. This is a historic uh, gain from redundancies that you've previously achieved and previously now made. it's coming through as a saving on... on, on um, on your workforce budget, on yes. your employee budget. Yes, and I think, I think also we need to look at the makeup of our budget. Some of our, quite a considerable proportion of our budget is in um, separate allocations from Scottish Government, and we're working with them to um, see what we can transfer into our baseline, because some of that money pays for um, staffing as well. Right, so it's related to the non-recurring becoming recurring? Yes, yes. Right, and I think someone else may, may want to ask about that. Will I pick up from the ambulance service perspective in terms of our efficiency savings? Um, you're absolutely correct. Uh, we have um, to produce 4.1% of efficiency. 3% of that this year, 14-15, will be cash, um, with 1.1% 1, 1 .1 being um, productivity gains. The ambulance service has historically um, achieved um, in excess of 3% cash release and efficiency savings over the last few years, um, totalling something in the region of about 20.1 million over the last three years. And, and we've been very successful from the fact that we tend to have work plans that go right across the organisation rather than giving individual targets to individual areas. One of our, our key uh, work streams at the moment is around our scheduled care service, where we've got a five-year plan um, to redesign that particular service. And in redesigning that service, we're making it more efficient and more effective. There have been workforce um, savings uh, emanating from that particular area. And we've achieved those um, through natural wastage, um, in terms of uh, people deciding to retire or, or move on to careers elsewhere, predominantly within the ambulance service. And that's how we've been able to achieve those particular savings. We also have other work streams uh, that are not uh, workforce related, and I can um, highlight those if the committee um, so desired, but I'll perhaps hand over to Simon um, yeah. to explain his particular efficiencies. 
Thanks, Pamela. Well, the, the National Services Scotland position is, is very similar to, uh, to the ambulance service. The majority of our efficiency savings come from service productivity gains. So we're creating and launching and delivering new services and driving efficiencies out of um, the existing services. The minority of our efficiency gains come from workforce savings. All of our savings are recurring. And I've been in this role for five years now. We've consistently delivered three to four to five percent savings each year in terms of cash releasing savings and have over delivered against our, our LDP target each year. In addition, along with Health Improvement Scotland and two other special health boards, we've actually returned cash to Scottish Government for each of the last few years, and that will total the best part of 20 million um, by the time we get to next year. The single biggest thing we've probably done as an organisation is our property programme, our property consolidation and rationalisation programme, which over a 10 year period will save the best part of well, well over 40 million pounds. And that's real, been the real driver. Now, clearly, you get to a point where you, know, you, you can't continue to deliver incremental savings because you've run out of properties to rationalise and consolidate. And we will hit that point over the next couple of years or so. But that's been the, the cornerstone for our savings. I um, hope that answers your question. Can I ask a, a supplementary? Um, uh, specifically, the ambulance service, the, the, the thing about du double manning, uh, you know, which has come up in the Parliament, the question of the relate the ratio of paramedics to uh, technician ambulance uh, individuals has come up and the question of passenger uh, passenger transport has come up i mean in those three areas you know are you increasing improving the the uh, the double manning and ensuring it's always double manning uh, where it's relevant and are you ensuring the paramedic uh, non-paramedic ratios <coughs> are these improving um, in terms of the um, emergency side of the organisation, which we classify as unscheduled care, that's your specific questions about paramedic technician ratio and single crewing. In those particular areas, yes, we have progressed well in terms of we do not intend to have planned um, single crewing. Unfortunately, there are some times when at very, very short notice uh, we have to have resources that are single crewed, um, but that is less than 1%. Um, we have some resources that are deliberately um, single crewed, that's our paramedic response units, um, and those are the services that we will be targeting towards those patients um, that can safely and effectively remain at home and require um, diagnostics and treatment in their own home environment. In terms of a traditional um, double crewed ambulance um, and Undoubtedly, that's paramedic technician ratio. That's your question relating to that. Uh, we are endeavouring to have a 60% paramedic, 40% technician ratio. We were um, supported by Scottish Government recently, um, about two years ago, in increasing the number of paramedic staff by 150. Um, however, it takes time to uh, train and educate staff um, to become paramedic level. So we're not quite at that 60-40% ratio at present, but during this financial year, uh, we're endeavouring to get to that particular um, uh, ratio because we need to make sure that it's the right skill mix um, that attend the patient. Um, sometimes that should be a paramedic and technician, but other times it's other skill mixes. Um, in terms of uh, scheduled care, um, that's the area that where you're describing as patient transport service, um, that does not have um, a, a particular skill mix there. Um, but what we're doing through our patient needs assessment um, is ensuring that we ask the right questions of those people that require medical assistance uh, en route to hospital or on return from hospital to make sure that they, if they require, for example, um, the assistance of two um, trained individuals from the ambulance service, then that's what they should get. Um, in some instances, it, they may only require one trained individual. Um, but that's really through our patient needs assessment that we ensure that we're getting the right resource to those particular patients. Uh, that's very helpful. C can I just ask one final question on this section? The efficiency savings, obviously, you know, we, we get them annually. We, we get the reports annually of what's been achieved and what's what's targeted for next year but really from what Maggie Watson was saying quite a lot of it is actually over a number of years that you you plan changes in service 
you, you, you have redundancies or retirements which allow you to implement those service redesigns, and the consequences are that you have savings subsequently. Uh, should we not be actually looking at this in the longer term? Um, and I suppose it feeds into what Simon Belfort was saying as well, that you know, as, we, as these savings are achieved year on year on year, there are areas like estates where there is going to be a, a finite uh, achievement. So, you know, it would be helpful in terms of forward budgeting if we had perhaps uh, the opportunity to look at this uh, over a three-year period rather than a one-year period. And I wonder if any of the witnesses have any comments on that. I'll pick that one up first. I mean, we, we're all um, required to submit at least a three-year plan um, every year in terms of our LDP, our service plan, our workforce plan, our, our financial plan. So the information is there. A number of boards, mine included, we actually internally, we look at five years anyway. And we kind of say, well, where do we want to be in five years' time? And then actually track back the actions and activity we need to take to now, because that tends to lead you down a slightly different route than just evolving from where you are. So the information, uh, certainly um, uh, government officials have um, detailed savings information from every board for at least three years, um, and that, that should be available. And likewise, um, I would indicate um, to the committee um, Scottish Ambulance Service have a five-year plan in terms of our scheduled care service. So that's um, a key work stream that will progress. We're, we're currently in year three. And also, as, as Simon has indicated, we are um, required to submit three-year financial plans. And so some of the efficiency savings that we're identifying in 14-15 will also um, continue in 15-16 and 16-17 whereas others it will be completing. Um, in terms of property, um, the ambulance service, um, as we have 150 locations right across Scotland, we have opportunities where we're trying where we possibly can to co-locate uh, with other predominantly health boards. But if it's not um, possible in a particular area and we're required to be located in that particular area, we're also examining opportunities with the other emergency services, uh, fire and police, and, and that work has commenced this year and it will be ongoing for, for several years. We made really good progress initially uh, with Dumfries and Galloway Health Board and Ayrshire and Arran Health Board. Um, not only will that be more efficient in terms of the public purse, but also it provides opportunities for staff to be co-located uh, with other healthcare or emergency services staff and the efficiency and effectiveness that brings and improvements it can make to direct patient care um, can't go without being said. Yeah, from Healthcare Improvement Scotland's point of view, I think um, if I can just put into context, um, we're just three years old and we have um, legacy organisations that we've had and so we've had a bit of sorting out to do if you like. Um, to change our model to um, deliver our purpose. Um, I think what's really important at this stage is to look at, um, we've got a relatively stable strategic environment at the moment. We've got the 2020 vision, the quality strategy taking us to 2020. We've got, um, we've just relaunched um, or redone our own strategy, which takes us to 2020 and aligns itself very closely with um, the quality strategy in the 2020 vision. So we're looking to the longer term now to how we can deliver what we need to deliver. And we're looking at um, different ways of delivering that. So inspection may not just be inspection, it may be a comprehensive, a comprehensive um, analysis of, of a board and we'll be using um, different sort of factors so we won't we won't just be going into a board and doing an inspection perhaps but we'll be looking at what patients have to say what public have to say what um what staff have to say perhaps what the ombudsman has to say so we'll be um in the round looking at a different way of delivering that and using uh, and working collaboration with others in order to deliver what we have to deliver at last but it's very welcome thank you very much indeed thank you <clears throat> just just on the efficiencies just to get some you know, detail about what that actually means. I mean, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, I think, I know what it means now, that, that, that to achieve 70% of your savings through efficiencies um, uh, in the work, via the, work, the workplace. Does this mean that the workforce that you have needs to go and be replaced with 
a workforce that you need for the future. Is that, is that the transition you're through? Because two years ago, when this committee was taking evidence for that, there was a big question about whether you had sufficient budget to do what you had. We lost a lot of institutional knowledge, inspectors that was there, and I think we actually started re-recruiting or, uh, or using contractors or, you know, all, all of... You know, is that all in place or was that a temporary transitional yeah. period? I think, I think you've touched on quite a lot of things that, that are still perhaps being um, finalised. We've got... Um, a lot of our savings will be through vacancy management. We have quite a big churn... Um, in our workforce during the course of the year. Now, that's largely because of the funding model that we have, which is um, we've got a baseline um, budget, but we also get um, separate allocations from government for things like the patient safety programme. So we can only recruit people, or ha we have only been able to recruit people on a sort of fixed-term basis. Um, now, that's all about to change because we're discussing with Scottish government about how to resource those particular programs. So we haven't, so we're, we're not expecting the same, the same turnover. Last year we, we had a turnover of about 9%. So we, we felt that the 70% of our efficiency savings through this route is, is probably manageable. We obviously have to keep a very close eye on it and um, it, it may mean that for some corporate services posts, for which I'm responsible, if, if they become vacant, we might just delay recruiting for a month or two, or we'll look at every vacancy that comes up, we'll be looking at how can we do things differently, how, how can that then en enable us to change the way we deliver? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not encouraging to hear we've got that, that had that chum, because we, we also know, to be fair, as a young organisation, we also know that it's been asked to do increasing amounts of work, whether that be the children, prisons, um, uh, you know, so, so it, uh, it is a bit of a, a, a concern. You know, I mean, I think some of these questions will apply to the others, and so I would appreciate if you pick them up. The earmarked funding, then, in terms of our 70% efficiency, just to help me understand, because I don't... Earmarked funding is provided for particular initiatives because you're directed by the government anyway. So they're OK. So we're looking at a core funding that is there that we're, we're, we've got to create the efficiencies on because we're basically negotiating packages of money to deal with the recruitment crisis, to, to deal with uh, additional responsibilities, say, to play a, a bigger role in inspection of acute services and clinical services for elderly care or something. Is that the way it works? So we've got this? Yes, our efficiency savings will be on our baseline, on our baseline funding. Yeah. So the yeah. funding that we then receive for, um, for example, the patient safety programme, um, that, won't, that won't be subject to efficiencies. Right. So the money we receive from the government will be, will be spent on... Um, exactly, you know, the, the exact As the, 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 the specified. Yeah. When it comes to um, yep. resourcing ourselves for um, going forward, I mean, we've resourced ourselves up to um, the local delivery plan, which has been agreed. Clearly, we get um, ad hoc requests during the year from the government, um, and um, or there might be some pieces of work that we decide we want to concentrate on, and we would, we would look to the service to help us to resource that. And I think it's really important that what we do is in collaboration with the service. And in the past, we have been able to use experts out in the territorial health boards uh -huh. um, to assist us. And I, I think that there's a, there's a really important philosophical, philosophical point here in that if we are um, a central body, we have to be as lean as is responsible, you know, re leanly resourced as is responsible so that we can... Um, deliver real value and, and free up funding t to go to patients. Yes. The, 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 I don't know whether I've lost it or not, but the, 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 the final point to that, I mean, the question to that, as you raised it earlier, do you feel that you need a bit more flexibility so you can use some of the, I think you referred to something earlier where you were discussing with the government where you could use some of these fixed funds to deal with some of the core issues. So we've got earmarked yeah. funds that you may not be spending at this particular time. But if you had flexibility, you could use elsewhere in the organisation. We would, we would still intend to use those for, um, 
for the purpose in which we receive the funding. Uh -huh. We're discussing with Scottish Government just now about having that funding put into our, um, being made earmarked or go into our baseline. Uh -huh. So then we, it, it potentially could give us more flexibility. Again, I'll, let you, I'll come to you, Simon, about just pursuing this, this wee one because I think they apply to you all. How do you plan your workforce and five years ahead when we've got a funding stream that is, is, is created, you know, that, that you've got there, you know, you've just described, and the workforce for the future not knowing what a government, irrespective of what government, uh, uh, is going to ask you to do in the next five years. You know, I, I, th I think we. Where's the plan and control of this? I mean, we, we can we can do that because we understand what our purpose is and because we set our own direction. Largely, I mean, we have um, healthcare improvement Scotland have some ministerial direction and some legislative um, responsibilities, but we, but we can plan those in. And I think that goes back to my point about there being a reasonably stable strategic environment until 2020s. Yeah. And getting good value is important, but we're dealing with Absolutely. health services here, so the yes. quality is also important. Absolutely. People coming and yep. going and, well, Simon Bell for our partner. Um, uh, we have our, our vision, our 2020 vision, which is in line with Scottish Government's 2020 vision about delivering more care locally to people in their own homes. Um, and from that, we're currently planning what our workforce is going to look like by 2020. And we anticipate that it may look significantly different from how it looks. So we have to uh, go with that. Um, we have to make certain assumptions. And we can also do different types of scenario planning. And that's currently what we're doing um, at the present moment. We need to make sure that we have got um, support um, from our territorial boards uh, in order for us to deliver more care locally at home, it's important that we have effective professional-to-professional -professional support networks, and we're currently in different parts of Scotland putting that in place. So I think you can plan um, for the future, irrespective of what um, the funding allocations are likely to be. You can do that through making certain assumptions and being able to build a workforce that is flexible and responsive um, to those particular changes within mm. the external environment. Yeah, I'm sure we'll come to risk and uh, those those plans as well and, and, and accountability because if you're working in that uncertain certain environment, who can be held to account at the end of the day, I wonder? Simon Belfer? Uh, I mean, it, it, workforce planning is an interesting one. Just come back on the earmarked funding bit. Yes. The, the, the strict definition of the, of the efficiency savings applies to the baseline. Clearly, if you have earmarked funding that continues at a flat rate for several years, the costs of delivering those services may not remain flat. So in order to live within the means of those earmarked funds, there are often efficiencies that one has to make. Yeah. Um, that's just you know, all sort of the world. I think it's interesting, Maggie, it says we're in a, um, a stable strategic environment. From an NSS perspective, I think it's, it's a little different. Um, as you know, we had the Public Services Reform Act passed a little while ago, and we're now in the Joint Working Book, kind of the only board with its own section around saying we can and are expected and are willing to operate outside of health. Now, clearly, we know there is health and social care integration. There is an awful lot of activity going on around shared services, so sharing between health, local authorities, and, and other public sector bodies. So for us... Um, there's, there's real clarity about our baseline bit in terms of the services we provide within the health service. For us, there's quite significant uncertainty as to the scale and timing of other requirements that may be placed upon us. And as an organisation, some of that is relatively easy to create flexibility. So if we take IT, for example, there is a ready market out there for flexible resource to help you kind of scale up and scale down IT activity. We've just run the SWAN programme, for example. When you get into other areas around things like data integration and, and, and how that might all work, um, there isn't necessarily a ready market of really qualified kind of people out there with the right values and perspectives, etc. So for us, we are trying to plan five years ahead, but it's in, in some areas of our activity, it's, it's, it's harder. In some areas, it's, it's relatively straightforward. Um, and uh, you know, we believe we're involved in all the right governance groups and all the right conversations. 
Um, but I suspect only time will tell whether we manage to get that balance of efficiency, so not having people and resources we don't need, versus effectiveness, so actually being able to deliver when we're required, whether we've actually got that right or not. We, we think we're doing a decent job, but I, I'm not going to sit here and say that I know for sure. Bob Doris. Um, thanks very much, Convener. I think it's a really, really important line of question you're pursuing. Um, Maggie Watson, did you see the, the staff turnover, if you include core staff and staff on fixed term contracts was 9%? It was last year, yes. Okay. Um, I think it would be quite helpful to know, and if you don't have it just now, fine, it would be good for you to let the committee know what the turnover is, if you like, on your, your core staff, um, as opposed to, because 9% could be a bit misleading, because if you employ someone on a two-year, if you employ 50 people on a two-year contract to a specific piece of work, that's, that, that's a little bit different from core staff turnover. Can you give me an idea of how you account for both those two things? Could I come back to you on that one? I don't have that. Right. Because I, I would have concern, so convener. Could, could yeah. you describe the, 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 you know, just yeah. the, your core as to your, your contracted? As the contractors, mm. inspector, inspectors? No, that, no the, the scrutiny and inspection is, is predominantly core staff. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, I think for... for for, for all three witnesses, that would be really helpful. Because I would, have, I'm suspecting you might now tell me what you think a, a healthy turnover would be of core staff to allow you that flexibility to redesign service uh, without uh, having to make compulsory redundancies and give you that scope and what you would consider to be uh, a, a danger. A danger is the wrong expression. Not ideal for the management of the org organisation because nine percent would seem too high, but I suspect it will be. A lot lower than that. If it, it will be a lot staff. lower. Yeah. It will be a lot lower than that for us. I think okay. one of the key things in, in our um, demographic, if you like, of our um, workforce, is that we've got approximately 10% of our workforce is 55 or over. Okay. So that's an area that we that we're looking at. Um, th th probably very very experienced, um, heading for retirement. We need to keep that experience. In the organisation, they may be willing, uh, perhaps, to go reduce their hours, so that would certainly save us some money and keep the experience in the organisation. So I think there's some engineering to be done around around the demographic of the workforce. And I think two in, yeah. in terms of the ambulance service, I mean, the, our staff are our core staff, and we're not in the same situation as Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And our turnover um, is 5.3. Well, it was 5.3% last year. Um, again, likewise, um, when we've looked at the, the demographics of our current workforce, 25% of our workforce is aged over 50. So over the next few years, we are going to experience um, a sig significant amount of turnover. Um, historically, people have tended to enter the ambulance service, sometimes working in our scheduled care service, and then they're able to progress their uh, careers through and into unscheduled care. However, our, 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 our more recent workforce, uh, we're seeing a lot of um, people that are coming out of university, uh, well qualified with um, degrees, but not degrees in paramedicine, um, and they are coming. They are now coming into our workforce, and um, our workforce of the future um, will require different types of specialist skills. That the ambulance service will be able to provide some of that but we're also looking to the university sector to provide um, some of that education. We currently have a partnership uh, with Glasgow Caledonian University um, that undertakes um, our undergraduate training, and we're looking to universities for some of the postgraduate qualifications as well. You seem to have to ask another question about whether you're planning for, for that, that, that ageing workforce, but you clearly are, so that, yes. that's really reassuring. I don't know if Mr Belfer wants to add anything. I haven't got to, information to hand, but I'll, to I'll give it to you. Okay. Now, the other thing I want, wanted to ask, convener, was I'm just wondering if there's an overlap in the different terminologies we're using. So could, um, I nearly said ring fence funding, it's not ring, ring fence funding, um, but e e if e earmarked funding, could earmarked funding also be non-recurring funding? Is there an overlap? Yeah. Can they be one and the same thing? Can it be the same pound? Um, no, they, they could be different um, funding. We sometimes get earmarked funding, which is for specific um, work streams, which could be um, 
maybe not just one year non-recurrent, but they could be for two or three years. For example, within the ambulance service, we've just taken on um, specialist retrieval services um, for Scotland um, for both um, adult, uh, neonatal and paediatric. That is earmarked to ensure that we utilise that for that intended purpose and to enable that service to be uh, fully established as one and taken forward. That will be recurrent, though. It will stay within our baseline because we intend to look after that service well for the next few years. Mm. But in terms of another um, type of ring-fenced or earmarked funding is for the Commonwealth Games, which we're receiving um, this financial year. Now, obviously, that's just for one year, um, although we did have um, some planning funding um, for two years previously, but once the Commonwealth Games is completed successfully, um, then that funding stream ceases. But I'm just checking that there, there is an overlap. I'm assuming you can be told this is earmarked funding. It's a two-year programme. You must use the money for that. Therefore, it's non-recurring after two years. It's only going to last for two years, and it's earmarked for that purpose. I take it that, in general terms, there will be overlap. I don't want to dwell on the point. I just want to be clear in my head. Is there an overlap between those two things? We, when we're dealing with the, the um, health finance department, we are, we are all very clear. There's, there are sort of three categories of funding, really. There's, there's baseline funding, there's earmark funding, and there's, there are additional allocations. Now, the baseline funding recurs from year to year. There will be an annual uplift that's de decided by sort of others for, for territories and for special health boards, and we can talk about that if you'd like to. Um, earmark funding tends to be um, more slightly longer term in nature. You have certainty, I have certainty this year the earmarked funds that have been said will be provided for two or three or four years will, will recur. The final area around additional allocations, which is more what Mount Pamela was talking around the Commonwealth Games, is stuff that actually, if that particular directorate doesn't have money next year, that program won't continue. Now, some of that can be a little unrealistic. So, for example, we've had a number of discussions uh, with uh, various parts of the health directorate around HPV. Because when that was first launched, they said, well, here are some additional allocations. Our view was, well, in order to get the staff, which is back to the point Maggie made, but also you're then really asking us to start providing a, you know, a long-term service. You can't then suddenly start the HPV thing and change your minds after two years. You have to carry on at least to monitor it. So that we've been involved quite extensively in trying to transfer money from additional allocations into baseline where it's appropriate. Now, clearly that gives me an efficiency ask because I need to find 3% of that money. But actually in terms of being able to find permanent staff to get the right IT contracts in place, it's really quite important to have the money in the right buckets. So we've taken probably 70% of our additional allocations out over the last few years, either because the programmes are finished or because we moved it across the baseline. Sorry, it's a long answer. No, 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 I, think, I think it's really important and, and I'm just, maybe it's my lack of understanding rather than a lack of clarity and I apologise for that. But Am I right in saying Ms. Watterson was talking about when earmark funding, which okay could be recurring for a number of years, but not not infinitum, obviously, when 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 it's better to rather than have staff in fixed-term contracts, but to make them permanent members of staff. And the discussions you have with government is when that should become the core and the baseline funding, and it's the how much you kind of transfer over on an annual basis. Is 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 there? Transferring the money over, but on a recurring basis. So it'll yeah. be it'll be following the model that Simon um, just described. Um, so we, we've we've got a number of allocations. I mean, last year we had about 40 separate allocations of funding, um, which in itself turns into a bit of a cottage industry in the finance team of sort of you know chasing it, finding it, allocating. You know, so that's not sustainable for us or for the Scottish government. So. Um, you know, we're working closely with them, for, for, you know, to transfer that across. I mean, it's an efficiency to be had immediately in terms of, of admin support. So, ju just this is my final question, convener. Um, so, would I, if I was to paint a picture of going those 40 different individual pieces of funding, recurring for a length of time, earmarked, fine, we get all that, and we go, well, actually, we can track some of those and go. They've been kicking about for quite a long time. It would make sense to bundle some of those together and transfer it into the core baseline budget, and those are the discussions you're having with government. And that gives greater stability for staff members. It gives them a career pathway, and there's an efficiency saving. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm trying to be clear in my head. It is. That's exactly. And, and, what we, and what we would do, because we would have permanent staff, 
um, we would be able to engineer exactly the type of stuff that we want and the flexibility that we want. Um, and we would have to be looking for efficiencies within all of that, and that would be to do with our processes, it would be to do with um, our different um, areas of our organisation working much more closely together so that we're not just all sitting in separate departments. Um, you know, there's lots of ways we can do that. I mean, we've got, you know, we would have to lean our processes going forward. But and I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's a it's a very simple solution to things. I mean, it is difficult, but it's difficult for a lot of people um, to manage budgets. Okay. I think the final question I would ask, you know, is just a, almost like a procedural one. When do you think um, this committee or whoever may sit in this committee this time next year or in two years' time or in three years' time, when would it be relevant to ask the question and go? You said there was work ongoing in relation to all these different pots of cash for earmark funding. Um, can you give me an update? How much of that is now in baseline funding? What does that mean in staff terms? How many individual members of staff are now part of the, the core staff team and have that clear pathway and have that stability? When do you think that... that I know it's, you say it's an ongoing process, but if a baseline was today, if you like, in terms of that process, when do you think... Um, we, we should get an update on that to find I'm, out I'm confident success. That, um, that negotiations with the Scottish Government are going well. They've got the same will as we have to, okay. to make healthcare improvement in Scotland's baseline more realistic. And um, I would expect um, that for uh, budgeting for next year, we would be budgeting on, on a bigger baseline because we would have um, resolved these separate allocations by then. I think, I think the thing I would say is, is, is the health service yeah, it works in annual cycles. So each, each year you would be able to see absolute data saying how much is in each pot. But it is rather like a bath with a tap and a plug. But as we sort out the stuff we know about today, new, new ideas, new activity, new projects, new issues start coming in as new projects. And it's that bit about trans when, when is it a project, when is it business as usual. It's that transfer yeah. process. But on an annual basis, you'd absolutely get the data. Okay. And Ms McLaughlin, I mean, uh, Scottish Ambulance Service and Bit of a different situation in relation to that. Yeah. Yes, our, our um, earmarked funding is about 9.6 million. As I've indicated, 6.6 .6 million of that is for specialist retrieval, which is a service that we will continue to provide for um, the foreseeable future. Um, so it's relatively small um, in terms uh, of our overall um, funding. So we're not in a similar position to Healthcare Improvement Scotland. If you put a context in numbers, and I has five years ago, ours was over 100 million. And it was 57 last year, and it's 33 this year. So we've made real inroads. Okay, can I thank you for your patience and uh, and, and taking me through how all that works? But I found it very helpful. Thank you. Was a grant? Thank you, convener. Um, can I take you back to non-recurrent funding? Um, Scottish Ambulance Service provided examples of what their non-recurrent funding would be, which was quite easy to follow. Can I ask the other two health boards to provide similar examples? Yes, we have non-recurrent funding at the moment for, um, for example, adverse events. We did um, a big piece of work um, last year look at, um, looking at all of the health boards about their adverse events, and we've created a framework that we're now implementing across the health service so people can learn from each other with their adverse events. And that's about £300,000. Um, in our, in our um, non-baseline funding, um, it's all, it's all non-recurring, so it includes the patient safety programme, which is just over a million pounds at the moment, um, death certification, we're um, busy moving to that, um, we're going through that process, and there's about a million pounds this year that we're expecting for that until it settles down, until we've actually stabilised the process going forward. It also includes uh, some of the money for the um, Scottish Medicines Consortium, for them to move to the new medicines review. Um, and we would expect that once that, again, that's a new process that we're, that we're um, developing and um, implementing. So we'd expect that to be um, going to the baseline in due course. Yeah, so that, those are probably the largest examples. Um, three examples from us. Uh, the first would be AAA screening, where the aortic aneurysm screening is new. And whilst we sort of, it's in that project phase, it's, it's there as, as, as a separate funding. It's not in our baseline, but hopefully over time, like some of Maggie's stuff, that would transfer into, into our core business. Um, and we've also been doing some project work developing um, tooth-specific data, um, data capture and data information. We're previously sort of dentists to sort of, the, the information's been on your mouth rather than at the tooth level. That's already delivering savings, but it's still at that project phase. 
Um, probably the third one I'd, I'd highlight is we do a lot of work through Health Facilities Scotland, one of our operating teams, around the whole asset and estates of the health service. And um, the, the state of the estate um, report is on the back of us having put in some software, and then we're going back around doing further iterations of uh, of project work to keep refining, keep digging into what's going on. So there's elements of that activity which is short-term funded um, rather than being in our baseline. So there are three quite different examples from us, I think. Thank you for that. It seems to me that an awful lot of that will become baseline funding in the future. How does that impact on your ability to plan, for instance, recruit staff because you've got non-recurrent funding? Are you confident you are... Um, carrying out those pieces of work as efficiently as possible, getting the right people for the jobs, given you can only offer short-term contracts at the moment. D does that impact on, on how you would it not have been better to have this as part of your budget from day one? You, you have to take that decision as an organisation as to how much risk you're willing to take. So in order to provide the service, if, it require, if, if somebody is simply not interested in working for our organisation on a fixed-term contract, but actually the service needs to be provided, then we end up having to take the risk of employing someone permanently and seeing what happens at the end. Now, depending on other conversations with government and other parties, you know, other health boards, other, other public sector bodies, there may be things for that, that individual, that team to do when the time comes. It depends how transferable their skills are. But it, it, is, it, is, a, it is a debate. We won't, we, for us, there's no black and white rules. It's if it's short-term funding, we get, we get fixed contract people. We're not that straightforward. Uh, because in, in many instances, we simply wouldn't be able to deliver the service to the required quality and time and, and, and other standards. So we, we do take those risks. And, and if I could just add, um, from an ambulance service perspective, um, a lot of the, if we know that the funding is non-recurrent and it's only for a defined period of time, we tend to target that funding into um, education, training, um, research, but where we require members of staff to be involved in projects, so for example, um, through the local um, unscheduled care project at the moment, uh, we're piloting in three areas of Scotland uh, community paramedics. So yes, we're taking staff from their current role on a secondment basis to work in those particular areas. And I believe that secondments um, are a very valuable way of being able to develop staff, um, giving them opportunities to work in areas uh, that they perhaps haven't previously worked in uh, but then you're able to if you're required to if there's no, if the funding source doesn't continue then you're able to um, place them back in the, their previous workplace I think with, with regards to my organization um, for example a patient safety program we've had we've had to take the risk um, as an organization of, of employing people on a permanent basis just to ensure the continuity of that when it comes to uh, the new medicines review for example and death certification we've agreed um, amounts with Scottish government about what we're, what we're expecting it to cost to recruit all of these people um, to deliver these pieces of work um, but what we will do in essence is we'll draw down that money as we spend it from Scottish Government rather than them giving us, um, you know, in the case of uh, the New Medicines Review, they may not give us the 815,000, we'll draw that down as we spend it. Um, because, with, you know, it's a plan about how we will spend that money and how we'll implement that process, but there may be delays in that, that it may be slightly more expensive, so we, we would negotiate that with Scottish Government as we go. And once those processes are, um, are complete and, and um, resourced properly, then that funding um, would go into our baseline and there would be permanent uh, recruits. Can I just, on a slightly different um, subject, go back to um, efficiency savings and ask um, uh, Pamela McLaughlin about the scheduled care efficiency savings you were intending to make? Um, yes, as I've indicated, that's a five-year project um, looking at our scheduled care, which is planned um, transportation of people that require uh, medical attention um, en route to hospital, um, predominantly for outpatient appointments, sometimes for oncology, um, or, or renal dialysis, uh, but increasingly uh, we're using that resource also for planned discharges to assist um, the territorial boards in making sure that they um, optimise their bed capacity, and that may be um, a transfer from uh, one hospital setting to perhaps step-down care 
um, or um, indeed uh, nursing home care or um, back to patients' own home. Um, and we've got various work streams ongoing there. Um, as I indicated earlier, um, the key to this is our, our patient needs assessment to ensure that we have a robust process in, in place to appropriately um, assess the individual people that require that type of medical assistance. Um, going on to um, our planning and how we plan the use of our resources um, and de de control as well to make sure that we've got a flexible resource that can respond to the needs of the patient and um, also to assist the territorial health boards. I suppose that, that concerns me because I suppose one of the biggest bugbear I get from constituents in the Highlands and Islands is the lack of provision for, for patient transport service, I think, which is what we're talking about. Um, disabled people who are not told until the day before of their appointment whether or not, in most cases not, going to be transported to hospital, which means that they can't attend, but neither on that time scale can their appointment be filled. So it mm -hmm. creates huge inefficiencies within um, clinics and hospitals because they have a no-show um, and also a great deal of distress to patients, sometimes elderly and the like, who can't make their own way. Um, is there any work go ongoing to see how we can provide a reasonable service? Because I get this throughout my whole area about missed appointments from both patients and clinicians. Absolutely, and that's why we're looking um, around our planning and our day control to ensure that situations, as you describe, uh, do not happen. We're also looking at our, our phone lines to make sure um, a lot of the demand that we're getting through our phone lines is for people to check uh, whether or not their transportation is booked or not. So we're doing work in that particular area to make sure that they, they're just looking for the reassurance and that reassurance is there. But as I'm sure you're aware, um, especially in you know Highlands and Islands, um, people there are a lot of people that require um, access to healthcare. Uh, they don't have a medical requirement for that assistance, and there it's working with um, the voluntary sector and other transport providers to ensure that there is a transport mechanism available for those people who only require transportation and not those that have a medical requirement en route to hospital. Um, and we're doing work um, specifically within the Highlands and Islands um, in respect of that at the moment. Given a, a large number of places have no public transport Absolutely. and there is a medical requirement for them to attend hospital, mm -hmm. surely we're building a tier two tier system if there is no way that they can attend hospital other than via the patient transport service? And that's absolutely why we're working with the voluntary sector um, who provide a very valuable service um, predominantly in those particular areas to ensure that the person has a uh, door-to-door um, transportation um, and we're doing what we can uh, to try and signpost and point people in those particular areas. But the ambulance service has a responsibility for those that require medical assistance en route to hospital. Mm -hmm. or home from hospital. And I'm, I'm aware the voluntary sector also help out with that, especially for disabled adapted minibuses and the like, um, but they're given very little notice, as are most of the volunteer drivers, as to when they're required. I mean, is there some better planning and where there is no voluntary capacity, what is going to happen? Whose responsibility is it to make sure that people can access health care? Because that's actually what it's about. Um, I mean, as I'm sure you'll be aware, it's, it's the health board's responsibility to ensure that people have access to their health care. The ambulance service has a role to play in terms of those with um, you know, medical requirements, uh, for example, um, if they require oxygen, um, etc. And we're working um, collaboratively uh, in different areas. Um, we're looking at transport hubs, again, within the Strathclyde area, um, Strathclyde passenger transport agency is working quite closely with us in that particular area and we're also looking to see what can be done in the more remoter parts where I absolutely take your point that there is not the public transport available in those particular areas or not the frequency of public transport that you would require. Richard um, <coughs> I actually had quite a number of questions in regard to efficiencies, but I think the, most of them have been asked. Can I move on to your service development proposals? Um, basically noting that healthcare, and you touched on it earlier, healthcare 
Improvement in Scotland in regards to the SMC New Medicines Review. Um, extra money being spent. National Services of Scotland in regard to service increase for in regard to implants and cardiac uh, conditions. And also Scottish Ambulance Service. It would be quite interesting to, to know what you intend to do in regards to urgent demand uh, services and also investment from discharge from, and you touched on it slightly, that's discharge from hospital and how you'll make a contribution in regard to the discharge process and how this has changed compared to the past demand and strategy. So I'd be interested to know what sort of service improvements you intend. You know, we've had all the bad news a minute ago. Can we have all the good news now? Is it specifically the new medicines review you want to discuss, yes, or is it just yeah. in general? Uh, just touching, just, just uh, you know, basically touching on each of uh, of the services. Um, just basically what you intend to do. Yeah, I th well, with the new medicines review, um, it's it's increasing transparency about the decision process and also um, opening um, the meetings um, about the decision making. So meeting in public. So that started, and that started in at the beginning of May. Um, the whole system for uh, end of life and orphan drugs is changing, and that will come through towards the the autumn. Th those decisions will have an impact um, by autumn. Um, other other areas that we're developing are sort of, uh, for example, scrutiny and assurance. We're looking at a more collaborative model um, with the health service. So we're looking for boards. Perhaps we're looking to move to working with them them doing a little bit more self-evaluation perhaps and we can come in um, and assist them to improve. Um, it may be that we put, it, we put improvement people in first rather than an inspection team. It may be we put an inspection team in with, uh, uh, and an improvement team follows. They may go in together a comprehensive um, assessment of, of care rather than just a pathway of care. Um, we're looking at, um, you know, empowering more people, sort of the um, implementing or helping health boards implement the uh, participation standard and also looking at um, assisting health boards with involving the public in health and social care yeah. integration. Um, so quite, quite a lot of work to, to do and quite a lot of good news that, good that, that, news. that you're, going to, yeah. you're going to be promoting over the next year. And, and we're also looking at quality and you know the quality strategy and um, how can we help health boards improve their um, quality infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So that's on the stocks as well for yeah. us too. Uh, Mr Simon Bell. <laughs> um, I, mean, I think that the services you've talked about there around cochlear implants and, and, and congenital um, cardiac conditions are existing services that will sort of develop and grow. I think the exciting stuff, it, it, the good news piece, is I think some of the new things. Um, the pancreatic islet, islet cells um, work yeah. that we're doing and for, for patients with certain types of diabetes can be absolutely life-changing. And, and Scotland really is world-leading um, on, on, on that area. And that, that, will, that will start to take off. Um, and, uh, two sort of IT ones, but very much enabling clinical activity. One is around things like the emergency care summary and key information summary and the, the electronic palliative care summary, both in terms of um, the information that's on there and, and, and that expanding, but also the user base and expanding that into scheduled care as well. I mean, there are huge numbers of clinicians make you know very regular daily use of that information to provide significantly improved care. Um, and we, I went to talk about the Scott Star stuff as well and the red blood cells. The other area, I think, is, is the Scottish Wide Area Network, where the, the contract has been signed and we're now starting that rollout phase of getting health, local authorities, Education Scotland, etc., onto one common platform onto which you can then plug in things that are genuinely effective and efficient in terms of um, increasing access to service, increasing the efficiency of service, increasing, increasing the resilience of service. So that's one of those things that you know, I think Swan sits very much in the background, but it's absolutely critical to the digital um, strategy that the, government, that the government has. So, so all the efficiencies you've made, as I say, we've just discussed, uh, has enabled you to, to look at, to transform and to innovate and to promote other items which um, you know, this committee is interested in, which patients are, are quite rightly saying we, we, we want. So all these other things are, are helping you to do, these, do this. Yes. Can I come on to Pamela yeah, in regards just, to the, the, the Scottish Ambulance Service? Okay. I was just going to lead on from what, what Simon said there about data. Um, 
having access to a patient's record and patient's medical information is vitally important for the ambulance service. Yeah. And the, the item that um, Simon indicated, the key information summary and the emergency care summary are two ways that um, our staff that are working in the community, they can access this information that will enable them to look after the patient and hopefully um, enable the patient to remain within their home or a homely setting. And that's why we are developing the community paramedics um, over three pilot sites within Scotland at the moment. We hope that... that where, where are those pilot sites? Um, in uh, Borders, uh, Lanarkshire and uh, in Shetland. Um, and on the basis that these are successful and we have to ensure that we appropriately evaluate them, then we would hope that that be a model of care that we could roll out further across Scotland. We've been very successful um, in Western Isles uh, with that particular model um, that's been ongoing for several years now. We really want to get a little bit of momentum um, behind that. And then going on to the other areas that we're investing in um, in this uh, particular financial year, um, the, the three RU or the three responder unit um, is, is very innovative and in fact it's world, world class. Um, where there's been a witnessed um, cardiac arrest, um, instead, instead of traditionally sending two resources a double crew, uh, we're now targeting that and sending three resources, which could <coughs> probably be a, a double um, crewed vehicle plus a single responder yeah. unit, paramedic response unit or indeed it could even be um, first responders. Um, and what we've found is, especially in, in the Lothian area where we piloted that, the return of um, spontaneous circulation, which across the world <coughs> is something in the region of between 15 and 20 per cent. We've been able to get that um, increased to 29 per cent. So we've seen the value of that. So in this financial year, we're investing in training and education and rolling that model out to um, Lanarkshire and uh, Greater Glasgow. In terms of, of urgent demand, um, historically we've predominantly used our accident and emergency resources to respond to this type of activity, which tends to be um, inter-hospital transfers, um, you know, for example, within um, the Lothian area from uh, the Royal Infirmary, Edinburgh, to perhaps St John's or the Western. Um, also, GPs um, uh, contact the ambulance service and what we classify as a GP urgent, which may be batched as one hour, <coughs> two hour, uh, three hour or four hour response time. Um, and urgent resources are the right resource to send to those particular cases. Uh, but we don't have um, sufficient of them for the, the type of demand. So we're currently um, reconfiguring our services both in scheduled care and un unscheduled care to make sure that we can increase uh, the level of those type of resources so that we can um, ensure that our emergency resource is ring-fenced and used for emergency activity, our urgent res resource is ring-fenced <coughs> and used for urgent um, activity and our scheduled care resource is used for scheduled care activity. And through doing that and targeting it and making sure that we send the right resource to the patient, the patient will see an improved level of service for their particular condition. And finishing, can, you, can, I, can I compliment uh, both uh, Maggie Watson and Simon Belfer for the work that you do? Uh, can I say to uh, Pamela McLaughlin that I've had personal involvement uh, previously with uh, the Scottish Ambulance Service and I compliment uh, the work that you do and, and also the service, the excellent service that you do have. You know, you. Very often you get criticised, but I, I, th I think you do a lot. And I think the three items, you, you know, the three of you have come out with items which are very groundbreaking and very innovative and, and, and will contribute to the best, I, I would suggest, one of the best health services that we have in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, Gia. No, it's just been answered in the interest of time, I'll pass. No other questions? Can I thank you all for your attendance here and the evidence you provided? Thank you very much indeed for your valuable time. Thank you. Thank you. I now close uh, and pre as previously agreed, go into private session. <laughs>